welcome uh, this this evening for those who are coming from um, into this symposium um, from Australia. I'd like to welcome you to the John Grill Institute for Project Leadership's second international symposium, Project Leadership in a Changing World. I'm Margaret Gardel and I'm the Institute Manager. And as we start this event, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we and my team are on, who are the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that other people are coming into the symposium from across Australia and also other nations internationally. So I would actually like now to introduce Professor Jennifer White, who leads both John Bill Institute for Project Leadership and the School of Project Management to open this session of our second international symposium. Thank you, Margaret. Um, as director of the Institute, I'd like to welcome you to the second session of our 2022 International Symposium. Uh, this is the second in a, an annual series of events to bring together the international community of scholars with leading industry to explore how project leaders and managers can respond to a world that is in flux, changing technologies, changing organisations and societies and a changing environment. It's hosted by, um, as Margaret said, by the John Grill Institute for Project Leadership. And John's welcome to the symposium and more information on the Institute is online. Um, and I think um, will be put into the, the chat on this session. Um, over the last 10 years, John's investment at the University of Sydney has inspired and educated project managers in senior leadership positions. We've got the ambition to be the go-to place for advice on how to conceive, set up and execute projects. As Margaret said, it's evening now in Australia and morning in Europe, and we've speakers and participants in this symposium from across the globe. And we welcome you um, joining us in your morning across um, in your and or in your um, in your evening. To give you a bit of an overview of the shape of the event, um, first we'll have a panel of experts talking on projects for resilience in a changing world, chaired by Dr. Nada Nadapadjo, who leads our doctoral program um, in the School of Project Management at the University of Sydney, and also co-leads the Institute theme on projects in, in a sustainable, just and resilient future. He will introduce our distinguished panel of speakers. Um, second, we have a couple of parallel tracks with research presentations from leading international researchers. Um, we had a call for papers and this has been a competitive process. And these, these two um, breakouts will be around um, papers on project leadership for a sustainable future and on a collaborative approaches and stakeholder management. And Dr. Mehdi Asadabadi, who chaired the selection panel, um, will introduce the session, uh, the paper titles and how we get in and out of these parallel tracks. Um, third, we have a panel of experts on achieving net zero projects as interventions, and I'm really delighted to have this distinguished panel talking to us about this important topic. It's very timely, um, and it will be chaired, chaired by Mashid, Dr. Mashid Tutonchi, whose own work is related to the energy industries, and um, she has an interest in this area. Um, so she will introduce our distinguished panels of speakers at the beginning of this session. In the final 10 minutes, we'll present the um, uh, Best Presentation Award and give details of next year's symposium, and we will finish at 9pm Australian time, so the whole agenda is in two and a half hours. I'd like to start the evening um, with three quick observations. So first of all, all, all projects are future-oriented. Um, in our changing world, they're used to achieve desired ends. For example, to manage response and recovery in the face of disasters, to design and deliver vaccines, to deliver future forms of energy, as well as adapting transport and delivering new infrastructure. Um, second, that, that these futures are uncertain. Projects require us to engage with multiple stakeholders with diverse values and evaluations of projects and what they deliver. And third, that they are interventions. They intervene into our world and into our natural environment. Um, while organizations through projects may provide ways out of our current crises, have the potential to enhance the world that we live in. And to mobilize projects in this way, we believe requires a significant mindset shift to take a systems approach and to see projects as interventions. 
And so we're keen to activate areas of international project scholarship through this symposium. And we're delighted to have such a high quality of presentations um, in today's session. Um, we have an associated call uh, for papers on, in project leadership and society, and we'd encourage scholars um, in the sessions to, um, in the audience, whether you're presenting today or not, um, to consider this as an outlet. So let us start our first session. I will hand over to uh, Dr. Nada Nadapadjo, who will chair this important uh, discussion on project lead, on, on, on project for projects for resilience in a changing world. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Uh, I would like to repeat the acknowledgement of the country as we are in the land of the Gadigal people of Eora Nation and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I don't think I need to say how excited I am to be to have uh, to have this panel and, uh, and this session, which is a very relevant to an existential crisis that we are all facing. Uh, and I would like to thank everybody who's joining us across the world uh, uh, as you know, there is this, this panel is at the same time on the same topic of COP27, and this is not by chance. This is showing the importance of the, of the problems that we are facing, and in any discipline, we are trying to, uh, uh, to engage in this, in this problem and solve this problem. So the importance of these topics for us at the John Grill Institute of uh, uh, Project Leadership, as Jennifer has emphasized, is evident by having a research stream on projects for sustainable, just, and resilient future. So without going into further, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Nader Nader Pajiu. I'm a senior lecturer and director of research education uh, at the School of Project Management. And uh, with me, I have uh, Martina Linenluke, professor at Macquarie University, where she leads the Center for Corporate Sustainability and Environmental Finance. Uh, Marcus Helgren, uh, professor of Management and Organization at UMIA School of Business and Economics, and Chris Queen, uh, who is the Director of uh, Resilient uh, Projects. And before starting the discussion with this esteemed panel, uh, I would like to start with the discussion that we initiated in the call for paper that Jennifer has, uh, has referred to on project leadership and society. And in that call, we started the argument that uh, projects do not have a good track record. Uh, they have been used extensively as a form of organizing that has led uh, to these global grand, grand challenges that, that we are facing. So these large projects often have focused on short-term gains in both the developed and developing countries and uh, disrupted the communities and their natural environment. So what we are trying to achieve in this discussion is, is uh, we would like to explore how can we change this track? Uh, how do projects in the changing work look like and what do we expect uh, in, the space of the, uh, in the space of the project management? So without going further, I would like to start with our first panel, panel, panelist, uh, 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 Professor Martina Linenluke. And I would like to ask you, Martina, that uh, you have been engaged with uh, International Panel for Climate Change and, uh, and I would like to refer uh, to the last report that you were also one of the co-authors. Uh, one of the underlying messages that we had on that report was that uh, they, were, they were calling it no or never, uh, asking for immediate, sizable, and meaningful action. So looking at this report as a bold signal that, uh, that uh, the, uh, emphasized for us that there is a need for a drastic change, what do you see as the role of projects in, in such transition? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Nada. So yeah, as you mentioned, um, I was a contributing author to the uh, sixth assessment report of Working Group 2. So focusing in particular on uh, adaptation um, impacts, vulnerability of climate change. So there's certainly, when you look at the report, the IPCC report, there's certainly no shortage of references to various type of, uh, types of projects, uh, for instance, uh, adaptation projects, mitigation projects, clean energy projects, and so on. So the sort of like project idea is very much embedded, I think, you know, in, in trying to achieve different uh, future outcomes here. 
So in terms of, you know, what we kind of see when it comes to these types of projects, um, we see references to projects that have worked very well, certainly in, in achieving desirable outcomes. But there are certainly also uh, a lot of examples, you know, where we see maladaptation, for instance, or ultimately, you know, the um, desired outcomes were not really delivered or not really delivered within the, um, you know, desired timeframes. So just sort of thinking about this, right? Um, I guess one of the questions here is, you know, how do projects potentially impact, you know, our ability to achieve um, a different future or transition to net zero, um, which is very important at the minute. But on the other hand, we also see the question around how is climate change, for instance, impacting projects. So we kind of have a flip side here as well. Just looking at, uh, I think, three short points that I wanted to make here, right? One of the underlying questions is certainly if projects are the right vehicle to achieve uh, the desired outcomes. And I guess, you know, the, the answer to that question is probably a little bit, it depends, right? We see some great uh, success stories in terms of, you know, projects being able to deliver successful sustainability outcomes, for instance, you know, future energy projects and so on. But um, we also see a lot of examples where projects are perhaps very infrastructure focused, you know, not really embedded within what the local community needs um, and potentially leading to maladaptation and especially very difficult when it comes to managing that nexus for so for instance we we see complexities around managing the water energy food or health nexus and I think sometimes projects really fail to deliver here. Um, Two other points are certainly around the temporal nature of projects and also the spatial nature of projects. So one of the questions here is whether or not uh, projects can sort of lead to that sustained um, future change that we really need. We see a lot of delays in projects, unfinished projects and so on. But, you know, the question certainly is also can we actually scale projects up? Um, fast enough, large enough to really kind of bring the transitions that we need um, globally, right? Or are they essentially just locally embedded solutions and perhaps not the right vehicles uh, to, to bring about change? So yeah, just a few points and questions uh, to my, from my side. Um, and yeah, I know the other panelists have probably uh, some, some additional views on that. So thank you. Thanks, Martina. And probably that's a good save, segue that uh, we go directly to Marcus. And uh, Marcus, I want to see in the context that Martina was was explaining, what do you think are the challenges uh, with the use of projects? Uh, and especially Martina was referring to the fact that in some contexts, uh, uh, projects might not be the, the right vehicle. Yeah. Um... I think I have kind of a gloomy picture of projects and a gloomy view of them. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, and the thing is, I mean, as Martina is pointing out, I mean, projects could be the most amazing thing and a way to kind of produce energy, motivation, and passion. And, and we need that in order to, um, to address the climate, right? We, we need that in order to produce change. And projects have definitely done that. I mean, the Sydney Opera House comes to mind, I mean, as a, as a kind, kind of construction achievement, but also the quick development of the COVID-19 vaccines. I mean, that's the kind of an amazing achievement in and by itself. And also social change, such as Me Too and so on. I mean, temporary organization, if we, Think about projects as temporary organizations. It have achieved fantastic stuff. But on the other hand, also as Martina is pointing out, I mean, projects could also potentially be the most dangerous way of organizing the rest, uh, and it can produce death and, and destruction. I mean, uh, the Manhattan Project comes to mind. I mean, it produced the, uh, the nuclear bombs, and thousands of people died, and some of our own research where we looked at mountaineering expeditions and K2 and specifically where 11 out of 27 climbers died in 2008. What we see is that the reason why so many climbers died and was actually attributed to the temporary organizational projects because the climbers, really professional, really good climbers, they knew what they were doing. They were pushing past the different margins that they had. 
and decided to continue. And by that, they also reduced their margins and they, they died. A lot of them died, 11 out of 27. And I would argue that in projects, we are taught to use smart goals. You know, they should be specific, they should be measurable, they should be acceptable, and yada, yada. But this kind of short-term goals are producing the problems that we are seeing with the, with the projects as well, with the temporary organizations. Because it limits our attention and creates a tunnel vision where we push too hard towards the goal. It motivates us. And all research teaches us that, well, short-term goals are motivating and it actually increases our risk willingness. So we take larger risks just in order to reach the short-term goal, forgetting about the long-term goal. And finally, it creates uh, temporary organizations, projects create accountability. And we don't want to lose. We, as, as humans, we don't want to lose. We don't want to kind of be on the bad side. And through this, we are kind of pushing towards the short-term goal, forgetting about the long-term goal, which means that projects will have a problem addressing the long-term challenges that we see in the, in the climate. Uh, I think they could be a part, but they are definitely not the uh, one and only solution. They are not the silver bullet. Sorry about the gloomy image here, but there's two sides to it. Thanks you. Thanks. This is a very critical view of the of the projects as a vehicle, and I can see that it has already dis uh, started some discussion in the uh, in the chat that we would go to them. And I would like to encourage everybody if there is any discussion and question, please uh, uh, please put put it in the chat, and we would we would get to the question as much as. Uh, uh, we can. So I would like to take this and 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 uh, and uh, go to Chris. And I would like to ask you, what shifts have you observed in the context of projects in a, in a, in a changing world? So in uh, so so Martina and Marcus have have suggested about what we might and we might uh, uh, we might not have. Uh, uh, what have you observed? That, that's a great question, Nada. Um... I guess uh, I'll take a um, I'll take a leaf out of Margaret's book and just uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on today too. Uh, I'm in Townsville, so um, I'm very fortunate to have a beautiful sunny location that's the home of the Woogara, Kapar, and Bindle people. So uh, lots of respect to elders, past, present, future. Um, I, I guess some. Um, it, it's all very interesting, and I, I really thank Martina and Marcus for giving such a great introduction to this idea of projects. I was put in mind of two particular things when we were listening to – gloomy is probably the wrong word. I, I think sceptical is a great word, and I think, Marcus, having some scepticism in relation to projects is a very healthy thing. Um, I was put in mind of two things. I was put in mind uh, of a book – by a terrific uh, project manager who, who very critical and analytical around projects, a gentleman by the name of Ed Merrow over in the United States. And he has a terrific book called um, uh, Why Mega Projects Fail. Uh, and, it, and it has a lot of information about the mechanics of projects and why they fail. And I think it's really helpful to understand that, I think, when we're talking about um, some of the successes and some of the failures that projects have delivered to us. And then um, along the lines of one of our commentators in the uh, in the chat box, there was a good uh, there was a good comment about um, how people be, are behind projects. And projects are the means to achieving the outcome. And the the phrase that entered my mind, and I hesitate to share this one because it comes straight from Hamlet, which is um, one of Shakespeare's potentially um, most contentious plays. But there's a line in that of uh, nothing is good nor evil, yet thinking makes it so. And I think that's true of projects. I think. You know, we, we can we can enumerate many projects on our hands where they were incredibly efficient and well organised, but they were they were deliberately poor outcomes for humanity. Um, and and you did mention some of those, Marcus. Um, and we can also enumerate plenty of projects. You know, children's hospitals and um, you know all sorts of other infrastructure that have had wonderful outcomes for humanity. And I, I think the um, I think the coronavirus vaccine is a particularly good one too, Marcus. It's humanity coming together to. Uh, to, to produce incredible outcomes in a short period of time. So, so I think the projects um, themselves are, are a vehicle, but it's the people behind them. It's the thinking behind them that really um, gives us some of these poor outcomes. And I was very encouraged by some of the, um, 
uh, some of the comments. So Martina told us it was it was effectively now or never, which is absolutely true. It's it's critical at this moment in time to pay attention to the IPCC sixth report. Um, it's incredibly uh, important to think along those um, future lines, and I think all all of the speakers today have have talked about that. So I think that long term thinking and. The, the way I look at it from the change, sorry, I am going to answer your question at some stage, Nana, is uh, uh, from the change, I think, you know, 40 years ago, we didn't see very much consideration of environmental impacts of projects. If we wanted to build a freeway or an electricity line, or anything, we just built it. We, we didn't care. And so what happened is environmental regulations came along and they made us pause. They made us think about the natural environment, what we were building over, the impacts that we were having, um, albeit in potentially limited ways. And they were looked at as restrictive at the time. But over time, the culture has changed and we're seeing more projects take their environmental responsibilities seriously. And I think this has led to a sustainability uh, focus on some projects um, and uh, not all projects. I realise there are still hard money contractors who don't follow uh, necessarily these lines, but I think sustainability has beaten the path. And, and of course, the, we're talking about today about projects for resilience in a changing world. And I think resilience can follow that same path that sustainability has. So where sustainability is pretty much an accepted idea, I think we're still in that germination process with resilience to some extent um, to, to get it as a more accepted idea. So, and I think many things are happening in that space. You know, Task Force for uh, Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, um, um, the Investor Group on Climate Change, closer to home in Australia and New Zealand. All of these organisations are, are, are trying to link um, the capital that we all need to, to produce projects um, with the longer term thinking and the outcomes that we'd like to see as a result. So do no harm, but also improve the current situation. And projects should always be looking to leave the world as a at least a slightly better place. And I think we are seeing that happen. So that, that's a change I've seen over a long period in project management. Um, uh, thanks, Chris. I, I think if we, I want to frame the discussion so far, there was this criticism of the of the project or critical look at the project uh, from from inside. And then you also discussed about some of these mechanisms. And I can see in the in the chat box there is a lot of discussions that they are uh, saying: uh, Is there is there anything inherent uh, uh, with the projects, or is there the intention, or as you Chris you mentioned, the people behind the projects who are making this happen? So I would like to take the discussion in that direction, as as uh, I, I saw the three comments were also relatively aligned, and ask you, Martina, do you think there is any uh, structural issues with the projects, uh, and and if it is, how can we make it work? Yeah, thanks. I think that's a really interesting question, actually, right? I think, you know, as, as Marcus pointed out, what we would ideally like to see from projects, right, is that they bring this energy, the motivation, passion, right? And I guess any type of project that is essentially not managing to really harness this sort of collective power and collective achievement towards a certain outcome, is always at risk of not really delivering what is required. And I think that can be potentially a large number of factors playing into this. You know, I mean, when you have a look at uh, online and just search for failed uh, clean energy projects, for instance, right, there's absolutely no shortage of examples, right? But that's not limited just to this sector, right? We find that with, with pretty much, you know, every other sector. So this is not just something that is common here to, to renewable energy, I would like to say, right? We certainly see that with other infrastructure projects as well, right? When we think about, I mean, I'm currently over in Germany, but we had a lot of delays uh, with a certain airport here, um, you know, that that took many, many years to actually come to, to fruition. So, you know, it's it's not just the, the clean energy projects, I guess, but, you know, given that this is like one of the kind of central interest uh, areas at the moment, right? I guess I comment on that as well. And certainly also adaptation and, and uh, mitigation projects as well, right? So what we often said, and as Chris already said, you know, there are many examples, you know, where especially large or so-called mega projects uh, are at risk of, of failing. And that's that's very well documented, sometimes just due to the sheer size, complexity, and I guess also human inability to really map out all the different stages and potential 
setbacks uh, that can happen throughout such a different project. But even on smaller scales, we see this, right? It can be poor planning. It can be a poor definition of the outcomes that are meant to be achieved, especially if we kind of think about um, projects that are being placed into the developing in developing countries where they might have been, you know, planned in developed countries, for instance, without really integrating the local knowledge or local cultural considerations. But we certainly also have, you know, difficulties around sometimes really, um, you know, um, defining the exact outcomes that are meant to be achieved when it comes to resilience, for instance, right? Resilience is, can be a very broad term in itself. So what exactly is meant to be achieved here? Who is meant to be more resilient or what part of society is more resilient? And we often see that in discussions around resilience, that it's not necessarily a uniform concept that will apply to everyone equally, right? There are real inequalities, you know, and some groups in society might just simply benefit more. For instance, I've just been working with colleagues on a project that has been looking at this nexus between, you know, climate change adaptation, but also trying to achieve um, outcomes, you know, such as gender equality at the same time. And that's not something that is usually factored into decision making, right? So a lot of additional challenges there as well to kind of achieve more than one sustainable development goal potentially, right? And that already introduces a lot of complexities in terms of bringing in all the necessary um, stakeholder groups to really see, okay, what what's the desired outcome? How do we define resilience? What type of resilience is meant to be approved against what type of hazard? Um, And I guess, you know, we are also at this sort of uncertain time where, you know, it can be also very risky to plan only for one particular type of hazard. Um, I think we are seeing that increasingly, right? So in in recent years, as examples, right, in Australia, we've gone through the bushfires, we've gone through flooding, we've gone through COVID, right? Now we we are facing additional issues when it comes to, you know, cost of living, for instance, right, Uh, energy affordability and so on, right. So I guess sometimes when we sort of think about resilience, it's also very kind of multifaceted concept and requires consideration that there might be multiple different hazards happening and not just narrowly achieving one type of specific outcome, right. So I think there's also a need to just kind of apply a broader lens when it comes to, you know, really considering um, especially how we achieve resilience. I think all of that can be extremely difficult to achieve if we try to do this all just within this sort of like one project, right? So I think what's required there, and, you know, it might not be possible, right? I'm not saying we need to have a project that is delivering on all of this. So I think there is a real need to kind of see also how different projects can work together over time to perhaps address a multitude of challenges, how they can be integrated in a meaningful way. And I think certainly, you know, the temporal dimension is um, is very, very important also with the view towards, I think projects also need to be designed in a way that we have sort of, you know, this this responsiveness to, to future uncertainty in there as well, right? So we might want to prepare for one particular issue in 2020, but then, you know, we might end up in 2025 and the issue is no longer the same, right? So I guess there's a question as well, how we can change potentially, you know, or adapt projects as well to to perhaps be, be more responsive to a multitude of different uh, challenges as well. Thanks, Martina. So, so the message I'm getting from from you is that uh, uh, is that we are facing a more uncertain and complex situation. And and uh, I want to add to that that uh, probably a lot of us would agree that projects uh, did not have track record in in addressing even simpler pro- problems. So we need a we need a probably a bigger leap, a major uh, major paradigm shift if we want to address these uh, complexities. And if I want to take this and to the role of project leaders in, in such a context. Uh, Marcus, I would like to uh, hear how you define the role of pro- uh, project leaders in the context that Martina was uh, was setting, especially in view of studies that you had in uh, leadership in extreme contexts. Yes, thank you. It's a good question. Uh, again, I wanna be a little bit against the grain, correct? In a way, and uh, I'm not sure that we should, or perhaps a little bit unpack, what do we mean by leadership? Do we mean the project leader or do we mean leadership? 
in the sense that I don't think it's about the project leader. It's not about an individual and how to do that, but it's about getting a team to work together to accomplish things, to harness the competences of everyone around, including stakeholders and so on. That's the only way to kind of move outside of the project, outside of the temporary organization, if one will, and also uh, address the complexity. Because one of the things that we know is that projects are good at addressing complexities compared to a permanent organization. But then again, you have this kind of temporary uh, temporariness that causes a little bit of hiccups in the organization. Uh, and also, I would like to point out that, I mean, in a crisis, such as the climate crisis, or the COVID, I don't know how Australia reacted to it, but at least in Sweden, we tended to look at kind of a single leader with simple answers or even simplistic answers in the sense that kind of just show up, tell us what to do and we will do it. And in a complex environment, it doesn't work because then we need to have the team to think together to address the local issues that we, that we have to, uh, account for those. Uh, so my point would be that we need the we need the team, and in order to uh, allow the team to flourish, flourish, we also need to have a very open culture where it's perfectly okay to say that no, there might be a little bit more to this than what we're currently addressing. We might head in the wrong direction. Uh, we might head for the summit. I see that we are heading for the summit, but this is actually a problem. We need to turn around, guys, or we need to do something else. And I think that's the way to perhaps allow the organization to learn over time so we don't end up with an obsolete goal, but we are actually adjusting to the goal, uh, to the long-term goal. Um, and... Uh, this is also what we what we could see with the again going back to the example with the climbers on K two, the ones that actually survived. They also had an open culture where a lot of them who turned around early, they could question their decision and they could question each other, which then again made them to turn around. They made the right decision, uh, whatever the right decision is, but um, at least they survived. Uh, so my message is we shouldn't focus on the individual, on kind of the leader, but we should think about leadership and leadership from a team perspective. Uh, uh, the please second please. thing is that... Sorry? Yes. No, please. Uh, yeah. The second thing is that I, in order to create this environment and get the team to function and get the organization to function and not head in the wrong direction, we need to be mindful about the little things. It's not only the kind of grand changes that we are doing, but it's actually in the activities that we have as individuals within the project, in a, in a temporary organization. The little things are the important ones because that is what allows a gradual change over time. That allows us to notice the change before it has been become too much. Uh, and finally then, and I think this is where the real challenge is, kind of how do we move from the project, the temporary organization, and allow the results to live in a permanent sense in society, in the organization? And how do we kind of how, how do we address the long-term issues that projects are not designed to um, account for um yeah that's me thank you and and uh, that's what i wanted to see when when you uh, especially about your first point that uh, that uh, there is also a lot of increasing discussions about the socialized uh, leadership as you were saying that uh, to uh, to see how this uh, leadership is happening within uh, within different uh, actors or uh, or different individuals and different groups who are involved uh, uh, in the in the project and i want to i want to segue from that and uh, and ask you chris uh, how different do you think is the context of project leadership in 
in a changing world, as we call it, uh, than the than the leadership as we know it in the in the business as usual. I think Marcus has touched on that really well, uh, and he left me with one or two questions to answer, which I love too. Um, but he, he was saying that leadership isn't necessarily about one person leading a project, and that's certainly a change I've seen over a long period of time. Le- leaders, leaders come from everywhere within a temporary organisation, such as a project, um, and it, it is about... Um, so I often think of leadership as warmth and strength. So the warmth part is you need to care about your team. You need to care about them as people. You need to care about the outcomes for the project. You need to care about the organization's outcomes. You need to care about the impact on the world. But you also need to have the strength to pursue the objectives and to be skeptical in the way that Marcus was describing, to question whether we are choosing the best outcomes and having an open project, a set of open project communications, as we've discussed already, is allows that healthy scepticism, not necessarily cynicism, but certainly a healthy scepticism where leaders in the project can emerge and ask questions and, and, and those can, can go to the sponsors. They can be um, discussed. They can be discussed within the team and decisions can be made that fulfill the, the project further. The, the harder question um, that Marcus left right at the end um, was about uh, you know the long-term impacts of projects. And in my mind, I think of that as making change stick. So projects are all about change and making change stick is tough, right? Um, and some of the projects that I do, we do, we do do infrastructure projects, but we do organizational projects as well around business continuity, emergency management and planning. And I refer to those as our hearts and minds projects. So those are the projects where we're looking for a culture shift. I, I think, especially in relation to resilience, we talked about resilience before as kind of a goal that you never reach, I think. You know, it's, it's, it's an objective that you want to obtain, but, it, but nobody gets the stamp that says, we are fully resilient, you know, fantastic, move on, do something else now. I think resilience is something we're pursuing. Martina talked about the changing face of resilience. As the world changes, the idea of resilience has to change. New threats emerge, you know, global pandemics, et cetera. So, so I think we refer to resilience as a maturity journey. And I think projects are a great way to step up that maturity. You know, if you if you look at it at a scale one to five, which of course it's not, but you know, in a in a in a in a bid to measure the maturity around resilience, we sometimes place some behaviors and some objectives and some outcomes in that scale of one to five. And and projects should be a way of moving from step one to step two or step four to step five, depending upon where the permanent organization or the permanent social structure or society is, you can use projects as to to kind of take a step along that path to greater resilience, um, which is kind of a never ending path. It's kind of a a spiral or an iterative process to build resilience. So I I think um, those questions were particularly good. I, I, I often think, and this goes back to the conversation about the, um, the vehicle and the driver and those sorts of things. I think there's uh, someone that buys the car. I think there are, there's the destination that you're getting to in the car. I think the analogy is actually quite good when you talk about vehicles. But, but one of the most important things, we, we often use the, word, the, the terminology PPP to talk about um, you know, you know, private um, public-private partnerships or private-public partnerships in, in projects. But I think PPP should stand for people, people, and people because people come up with the ideas for projects. They see the problem that will be solved by the project. They see the change they want to see in the world. People execute the projects, and people are always the beneficiaries of the projects. We, we do a lot of natural hazard projects, and if, uh, if a storm or a cyclone crosses the coast in North Queensland where there's very little population and no environment of significance and everybody breathes a sigh of release and we say that was a hazard but it wasn't a disaster. But if a project crosses the coast in the middle of a, of a city where there's lots of people and potentially old structures, pre-1980 structures before the building codes were, were improved after Cyclone Tracy, we, we see um, much damage and it becomes a disaster. So, so I think, you know, looking at resilience as a mechanism for disaster risk reduction is really useful. You know, going along that journey and trying to ensure that uh, we reduce the risk of a disaster is a really, really helpful way to look at resilience and, and looking at it as a maturity journey, a, unfortunately a never ending maturity journey, but still a maturity journey nonetheless where we can uh, reduce that disaster risk and, and move on. I, I guess I'd like to sort of just say one thing to all of the people that are on the um, call at the moment. There's an infrastructure boom. So it's not just infrastructure, it's organisational projects. There's a boom at the moment of change. We all understand the need for change. So as project professionals, 
you actually have a lot of power in 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 what is effectively a market um, to, to to get your voices heard. So what I've seen many organisations that I consult into, I do project. Um, mentoring through the Australian Institute of Project Management, and, and they are listening to the young project professional. I say young, but anyway, uh, you know, young project professionals in that organisation who are interested in sustainability, who are interested in these things. They want to retain their talent. So you might be part of an organisation that looks like it's a little bit cumbersome, a little bit old, but make sure your voice is heard because, uh, as Martina rightly pointed out, it's now or never. And, and organisations that are executing projects at the moment are very interested in retaining excellent people because projects, people, 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 right? So um, make your voice heard. Absolutely advocate for the change that you want to see in the world within your projects, within your organisations. And I think it might not be now, but I think we will take steps along that maturity path and potentially um, create a more sustainable, sustainable resilient, and perhaps even a more just world, I hope. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we are almost at the end of our session, and uh, and uh, and I, I see very interesting discussions coming up in the in the chat. For example, there is a question that uh, they are asking: What other organizational forms are 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 there? For example, what are the alternatives to projects, and and what are they achieving? And there is another discussion that they are asking: For example because projects are driven by the organization, is that uh, multi-level uh, view of seeing, for example, the incentives coming from the organization to the project uh, solving the, 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 the issue or not? Is it one of the, uh, the solution to create the incentives that, uh, that Marcus is uh, mentioning or not? So probably we have one minute. If any of the panel members want to, uh, to quickly add a, 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 a silver bullet uh, <laughs> or maybe just a, uh, just a point about these, uh, uh, especially these incentive mechanism between organization and project. I have honestly no idea how to do this in under a minute, to be honest, because there are yeah. a lot of, that's, that, that's, uh, that's, you know, a lot of points there. I guess, you know, just, uh, just a couple of thoughts from my side, right? We see that projects are often motivated by crises. And that was also point mentioned on the discussion, right? And I think we probably need to look beyond that, that we don't just always react to a crisis, right? I think sometimes we also need to be better at abandoning unsuccessful projects. And lastly, in terms of alternative forms of organizing, there's, there's a lot of really interesting literature, you know, that looks at multi-level sort of developments within society, right, where essentially you have a lot of confluence amongst different actors on every different level, right, the individual, the organization, policymakers, and so on. And we see those societies that have that are sort of better at transitioning. Thanks a lot, Martina. And uh, and uh, we, we have, uh, this is very interesting because we are also living with a lot of questions. We came with some question, we, we leave it uh, with uh, more question. And again, uh, we would be more than happy to hear uh, if uh, the, if you want to reach out and, and continue the discussion to, to us and, and, the, and the panelists. Uh, but uh, with that, I, would, uh, I will pass it to Margaret to hear about a very interesting session that we would have uh, next that uh, there is a cherry pick of you, very interesting uh, research. And I would like to really thank our uh, panelists Martina, Marcus, and Chris. It was very insightful, and, and I have taken some notes and some questions that I will come back to you, all of you after the panel. Thanks, Nada. It was a very, very interesting panel. So thank you very much to the panelists and all the interesting questions. It was great. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, if you want to pop your cameras off, thank you. Um, so this next session, um, we will have the opportunity to go into two breakout groups for some short presentations from um, some of our leading scholars presenting some new research. So that'll be a very interesting opportunity. Um, so to introduce that part of the, uh, the evening or the morning, um, I would like to introduce Dr. Mehdi as a Abadadi um, to introduce the research presentations and outline how this session was curated given the very excellent quality of papers that we received. Thank you, Margaret. Um, uh, the planning for the next session uh, commenced in uh, August this year with a call for papers and we received uh, many submissions, uh, much more than what we were capable of presenting. So we were quite selective. And as the chair of the selection committee, I assure you that you will be listening to high quality presentations in these upcoming uh, <clears throat> sessions. 
I was supported by an excellent team, the Selection Committee, Associate Professor Natalia Sergiva, uh, Dr. Sunila Lobo, and Dr. Uh, Luigi Mosca. Before the final notes tonight, we will select one of these presentations to be awarded the best uh, research presentation award. Um, commencing in a moment, we will have these uh, two breakout rooms. Uh, room one is on project leadership for sustainable future, chaired by um, Dr. Luigi Mosco from Imperial uh, College London. Room two will be on collaborative approaches and stakeholder management, chaired by Associate Professor uh, Natalia Sergiva from University College London. Uh, it's now the time to join the breakout room and see you on the other side. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present my, my work here. My name is uh, Rodrigo Juarez, uh, and this is part of the uh, research that I'm doing for my PhD at the University of Leeds um, with my supervisors and co-authors, Dr. Tristano Sainati and Professor Giorgio Locatelli, who will both be speaking in, in the other sessions as well. And the, the title of my uh, paper is Project Leadership Reasons for Terminating Infrastructure Mega Projects. I'm going to briefly be talking about the problem, the methodology, and, and the results. Um, so when, when we talk about the, the literature or when we uh, go into the literature that talks about infrastructure mega projects, we usually find that it mainly discusses that mega projects are usually delivered over budget late without delivering the expected benefits, but it mainly talks about projects that have been uh, completed, right? Uh, projects that have been materialized. And, and, and it, it's not very common that it discusses or it talks about uh, projects that have been abandoned or left unfinished, um, as there is this common belief that once they, they are started, they are too big to fail and too costly to uh, to be stopped halfway, right? Uh, so this led us to to conduct a further review on 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 what what literature says about unfinished infrastructure mega projects and project termination. Um, so project termination is a topic that is not uncommon, perhaps in in new product development in IT projects or uh, or other other sectors, but in construction, it mainly focuses on, on the initial stages of projects. Uh, usually projects do not go into execution if they are not ready or well prepared to go, uh, ideally. Um, but um, when it happens, uh, we were in, very interested in, in what happens or what are the impacts to the society when projects uh, get, get terminated. So for this, we are employing escalation of commitment as our theoretical lens. Um, but in a in a in a different way because escalation of commitment usually tries to explain why projects are delivered at at any cost, um, but but it mainly focuses on projects that have been been completed. Again, bringing coming back to our first point, but we're using escalation of commitment as a way to explore how projects are driven to a failed completion, right, or not not completed um, and delivered what they were expected to do. Um, so um, by exploring more more on the side of the exit gates or the stage uh, the gate stage process that literature explores, uh, research question is why do infrastructure mega projects break off during construction? Um, so to clarify more on on the problem, um, we're looking at projects for uh, which infrastructure mega projects for which um, construction started. Uh, one case of that is the NAIM project in Mexico, where, where I'm from, and I published uh, a paper on, on that talking about the reverse escalation of commitment. The Juraga nuclear power plant in Cuba, or more recently, the Keystone XL pipeline. And we're interested in finding the mechanism that led to, to the actual termination during the, the implementation phase. So for this, we use a case study approach in which we're studying seven sectors, mainly nuclear power, oil and gas, cities, transportation, and so on. And we uh, collected our data mainly on, on secondary sources uh, from industry reports, journal articles, institutional websites, or online newspapers, um, and conducted a, a, an inductive thematic analysis um, to identify which are the most common determinants or reasons that lead to the projects being left unfinished, uh, in which we have five categories, mainly sociopolitical, environmental, financial, regulatory, and first major. 
which are divided into uh, in 12 subcategories. So mainly we have uh, the sociopolitical, first one refers to, or, or we find that it's mainly divided in social opposition and political or, or government acts. Particularly the second one, the government, the political or government acts, for instance, talks about referendums, for instance, or uh, government interventions to uh, to to stop with uh, a certain to stop a certain project. The environmental mainly talks about the endangerment or exploitation of, of protected resources. For instance, the case of the Xiaon and Hai Dam in, in China is very relevant to explain this. Um, the transition to cleaner sources of energy, such as the Keystone XL pipeline, which was one of the examples I um, showed you before, or misrepresentation of the environmental impact assessments. Um, in the financial, we talk more about cost and time escalations, which is uh, a phenomenon very present in many of the projects that, that we uh, analyzed. Lack of funding, uh, for instance, like the Modern Fountain Smart City, which construction started, but they were not able to, uh, to obtain enough funding to continue going with the project. Or economic contraction, which is actually one of the main um, issues that affected uh, uh, many of the power plants that we were investigating for which the development of the project was not, uh, the, the demand did not justify the investment of the project anymore. Um, in the regulatory category, we find sanctions or uh, for instance, like the South Street pipeline in, from Russia to, to the European Union, breach of regulatory requirements or lack of permits, for instance. And finally, uh, first major, uh, which we uh, will explain a little bit further. So, what we found is that mainly project termination is, is likely to occur in, in scenarios of, of crisis. This is what, what literature says, but, but also we found that um, it is a way to respond to, to a particular uh, crisis uh, in which projects are sometimes temporarily suspended um, as a way to, to stabilize what uh, the, the circumstances that they are facing, and then they are resumed until they are concluded. Um, projects get terminated for multiple concurring reasons. Um, although most of the projects that we analyzed have a, a main reason why they are terminated, um, that main reason is all often supported by some series of additional reasons that, that happen uh, simultaneously that, that lead to that uh, particular decision. Um, we found that uh, in most of the cases, the government has a pivotal role in, in what it's called pulling the plug, for instance, uh, mainly because uh, we have, for instance, uh, the example of um, the Montalto de Castro nuclear power plant or the Sventendorf nuclear power plant in Austria, or even the case in, in Mexico, where the different environments, different contexts, and different uh, governments in different centuries uh, lead to the same outcome. And finally, the first majority is the only instance in which private stakeholders terminate uh, infrastructure mega projects, such as, for instance, the Mozambique LNG plant, in which um, uh, the company decided uh, to to close the to terminate the project uh, temporarily because of a certain um, insurgent attacks in 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 the region. So um, basically, with that, I'm I'm done. Uh, looking forward to receiving your comments and. Thank you very much. I think now we can move to Robert. So Robert, are you ready for to show your yes. screen? Wonderful. My name is uh, Robert Beerwolf. Uh, I work for the uh, Dutch Ministry of the Interior uh, for the Bureau Gateway. And if it's correct, my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Peter Franks is also uh, on board, but uh, possibly as an unassigned uh, participant. Uh, he's the head of the uh, Bureau. Um, and, and let me open this presentation by saying, uh, uh, once there was a man who said, I have a dream. Um, and I would say, I have an idea. I have observations I want to share. I'm looking for others to connect and to start dialogue. So as, uh, uh, as a government, we also uh, run major projects uh, and not all of them uh, are successful, so to speak. Um, and we are understanding that uh, this has been going on uh, for quite a long time. Uh, and actually there's an upcoming uh, uh, paper to be published by uh, uh, Peter Love, uh, Jeffrey Pinto, and uh, uh, Mr. Ika about 100 years of pain and uh, still no success. Uh, so it's an ongoing thing which makes you wonder how does it come, doesn't it? Uh, ourselves, uh, uh, Peter and I, we are primarily practitioners. Uh, we're basically uh, practitioners 
uh, but we also try to uh, embed research in the uh, ongoing uh, and normal process of the work that we conduct. Um, and we are, uh, uh, I would say, uh, inspired by uh, the ground theory approach. Uh, we use the gateway reviews uh, as a source of data. So this presentation is not about the gateway review itself. You can find it, uh, uh, it's being used in the UK, uh, but it's also used in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, uh, and maybe our submission uh, of our standard paper may lead to new connections down under uh, to talk about this. So the reviews provide us data. Uh, we conduct some uh, uh, 40 reviews uh, per year, uh, which is far less than, for example, happens in the UK. Um, and from the uh, reviews, uh, we get the data. And the data to that expect are the review reports, which contain the recommendations. Uh, and what we do, we codify the recommendations from which we uh, then uh, see patterns emerging uh, and the patterns we discuss in focus groups to give meaning to those patterns. Uh, and then we change our uh, behavior on the basis thereof. This is one of the um, uh, uh, findings earlier reported. Uh, we call this model the, uh, the lucky clover. Um, and we actually noticed that many, many, many of our recommendations were on the right-hand side of the clover, uh, dealing with the uh, primarily with the process of project management. Uh, but there was also a need and interest to have discuss how do we uh, work together, our culture and our relations. Um, uh, and so we noticed the imbalance type started to steer towards creating more balance. Um, right-hand side, typical hard factors, left-hand side, typical soft factors, the human factor, um, uh, which kind of uh, coincides with the idea that uh, Professor Stuart Clark mentioned in the first session on uh, November 3rd, uh, projects are social endeavors. Um, as I said, uh, we try to, uh, or have been inspired by Miller's Prism, um, uh, where we think about how we go about uh, from data to patterns through coding, using focus group to give meaning and ultimately changing uh, our way of working. Do note that uh, the Gateway Reviews uh, uh, is supported by a so-called Gateway Review Community. These are all civil servants from the uh, Dutch government. We have some 300 of them. Uh, they are all at the level of uh, senior responsible owners. Um, so to that end, we're not necessarily trying to change the behavior of project managers, but change the behavior of the responsible owners, uh, understanding that we uh, deal with uh, human factors uh collaborating people truly trying to collaborate um we once referred to this uh thought as uh research through project management uh which we try and hope to foster by basically saying let's not have one-off research projects but have it continuously um uh, almost embedded or as a site process supporting activity process uh, with our normal way of doing uh through which we can um uh, create a, a control loop. One thing to uh, really understand is the gateway reviews we do in the Netherlands are not done from a compliance and control perspective, neither are they mandatory, they are voluntary, uh, but they are positioned uh, from a uh, offering a helping hand and from a learning perspective. Um, and the gateway uh, review community then operates as a community of practice uh, which is built on trust uh, from peers. Uh, and that's actually, I guess, maybe a magical reason why it's working, why this uh, learning uh, uh, way of learning works. At this point in time, as it's an ongoing activity, we have left the social, uh, the, the lucky clover, and we have moved uh, towards this new model, uh, a new artifact we refer to as the wheel of connection. Note the artifact's purpose really is to uh, engage our dialogues during uh, the gateway reviews. Uh, so it's not a, a framework that must be filled in, but it offers the ability to talk about uh, certain uh, subjects. Uh, this new model we've just introduced this year, so we are waiting for more data to come through uh, the gateway reviews we conduct to see how this operates, what new patterns will emerge uh, and how that may induce uh, a change of behavior. The mere fact that we are able to discuss this one is already a change in behavior. 
uh, because now we're talking about things like shared ownership, uh, because the responsible, it's not necessarily one responsible owner that drives the major projects, uh, but there is a association uh, of different uh, entities that need to uh, take care of it. I think I'm almost done with my eight minutes. Um, uh, so I would like to uh, basically say, did it inspire any of the audience? Um, and might this be uh, leading to new dialogue with uh, others from you? Thanks. I would like to invite you now, Dikle, to share your screen and to start. Hi, everyone. I'm Dijle Kortantemer. I'm a lecturer in project management at the University of Leeds. And today I want to talk to you about the role of leadership in creating value through projects. Um, so projects have been increasingly playing a bigger role in creating value for organizations. And this was also recently acknowledged in PMI's Pulse of the Profession Report 2021. This report is very much in line with the emphasis um, the traditional project leadership literature puts on individuals, the behaviors of senior managers in creating positive effects in the creation of value. While this is plausible, um, what I argue today is that it is crucially incomplete. So um, that's going to be the focus of this presentation, how project leadership can contribute to a drift away from the ideals rather than towards them. And um, this talk is based on a case study I did in a traditional financial services institution between 2017 and 2019. I was tracing a project ethnographically. That means I was observing meetings, um, looking at the documentation, having conversations with people, very much embedded within the project. Um, that was within the risk services function of this um, institution. And this project that I traced from its beginning till its end um, was very much crucial for um, the organization to reach its aspired future ideals. Specifically, it was focusing on two aims. The first was um, developing risk-related products and services through innovative big data technologies. And second, um, through establishing Agile as a new way of working. Both of these aims were crucial for competing with fintechs, the financial technology companies that have been disrupting competition in this industry, but also responding to the regulatory concerns that not having a consolidated risk view and working in silos um, was, were the primary reasons behind the global financial crisis of 2007 and 8. So um, what happened was, as I was observing this project, I observed a gradual drift away from ideals um, over the two years. And this occurred through an interplay between the efforts of the project team and the project leader, the manager, to reflect the ideals um, of, you know, um, that I've just talked about in the project structures, but at the same time having to conform with the rules and the processes of other organizational units and professional norms. So to give you an example, for example, um, the, they, they adapted the Agile rituals um, of having sprints, that is um, two weekly deliverable cycles, but at the same time, very much in the front end of the project, um, they had to conform with the rule of the organization to commit to a specific deadline and a specific delivery of very much um, move from collaborative um, uh, evol evol evolving through um, towards uncertainty to actually a contractual engagement, very much the more traditional way they were used to. And this interplay kept on going, this conformative uh, increased over time, and ultimately what we observed was a goal displacement. And this is a term that has been used by some of the seminal leadership and organizational theory scholars like Burns and Selznick. It refers to a departure from future aspired ideals towards more technical immediate goals. In this particular project, what that meant was a departure from the ideals I've been talking about towards delivering something the regulators would find acceptable within the time frame. And um, that, that resulted in an application that was slightly slicker, that was slightly faster, but developed in a very much traditional siloed way and really not groundbreaking in any way in terms of big data technologies. So 
Why did that happen? I mean, the academic literature already tells us stuff about why gold displacement happens, but this case um, just extended on those insights. The first one was survival in a competitive environment. And if you look at Selznick's work, he does talk about organizations competing with each other and that possibly um, producing gold displacement. He also talks about rivalry within an organization. And this was the case in this particular project. This project was a new entity and it was competing with more permanent functions that were well established and really did not want this change. So that was one of the reasons. And um, the, this organization was based on a market logic, which meant that everyone had to fight for their own revenues, which kind of intensified this competition. The second reason was um, that within this organization, there was an emphasis on both outputs and outcomes. And the division of labor was such that some senior managers were responsible for the development of delivery of outputs, and the others were responsible for outcomes. So while the academic literature has already talked about um, the difficulties of having multiple goals within an organization, this is the work of Burns, but also some of the project management literature says if project leaders focus on outputs rather than outcomes, that's problematic. What we see instead here is that is a, is a condition in which we, we have outputs and outcomes competing with each other because different senior managers are accountable for them. And this competition resulted in the favor of outputs. And one of the reasons for that is the third um, point on the slide, which is the rigidity of the regulatory deadline. Basically, um, what's at stake with missing that deadline was major in terms of job losses, reputation losses for the organization. And that meant that, you know, there was a power asymmetry and the outputs rather than the outcomes were preferred when they were competing. So if we come to implications, what does that mean for the theory or the practice of project leadership? Well, the key message is to pay attention to conflicting organizational values. And this has already been um, highlighted by Jennifer White and colleagues in a recent paper they wrote about socialized leadership. The insights of this case study build on and extend them, particularly in terms of um, sensitizing us to the potential negative effects of project leadership and the organizational conditions that actually um, contribute, contribute to producing these effects. So um, while uh, the paper by Jennifer White and colleagues, for example, talks about compromise making, what we get here is a bit of a caution that um, compromise making might be tricky in certain situations and perhaps we need to turn to some other ideas like integration, some of Murray Parker Follet's work, to kind of explore those alternative avenues in um, joining those um, different competing organizational values. And the other thing is obviously um, the rigid deadlines and power asymmetries that we need to be careful about that might actually um, contribute to a certain way in which these conflicts might be resolved. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm doing with time, but I, that's pretty much uh, my presentation. And I look forward to um, continuing the conversation here and offline with anyone who wants to do so. So thank you so much for your presentation. I would, uh, I would like to invite now uh, Evnice to share your screen and to start your presentation. So uh, good morning, uh, afternoon, everyone. I'm Yunus Maitorena. I'm a senior lecturer at Manchester Business School. And together uh, with my colleague, Natalia Sergeva from University College London and Graham Wench from uh, the Business School, we uh, have been working around the idea of the role of leadership, leadership for sustainability transitions, really um, trying to fit uh, with, with the call of the symposium. So. Uh, what we want to do is present uh, a leadership model that we have developed and we are currently piloting. Uh, and the focus really has been within the realm of uh, trans sustainability transitions. So there has been an increasing focus on the move towards sustainability transitions and achieving the net zero carbon emissions. And that has significant implications for effective project organizing and of course for the leadership of that. So we are now in the fourth revolution, as indicated in this diagram, and there has been increasing um, uh, 
um, focus on or input or investment in generation of uh, power through reno renewable energy sources. And of course, this, uh, this um, revolution is now being underpinned by sort of the new digital technologies and innovations and artificial intelligence. And that also has implications for project leadership. So for project leadership, um, we need, therefore needs to appropriately respond to those, these new challenges that are being posed by the changing world in a way that goes beyond the traditional project management approaches. So we, we really call, like the idea of, of uh, Joseph Champerter that calls for new combinations. So new combinations require leadership while sort of steady state uh, requires managers. So we are within that sort of uh, new combinations and looking really at, at leadership. Now, our work draws um, quite significantly on the work of Ancona and colleagues from MIT, where they developed the concept of the incomplete leader, just like the previous presentation, you know, made the point that sort of that aspect is incomplete, just focusing on the single individual, the leader. Uh, we, we argue alongside Ancona that leadership is relational. It's a relational phenomenon, and we need to move uh, beyond the role of and the focus of the individual leader, thinking of the project leader as a hero. Um, we also draw on some ideas on from the literature on leadership, uh, which focuses on different members of leadership. So we take the idea of the leader as also a problem solver, uh, as, as a teacher, and leadership that focuses not only on self, but also on, on others. So we move that argument uh, a bit for, for, forward. So it, we, we developed the functional model uh, of, Ancona, of Ancona, and we're interested really in not only on who leaders are, uh, which has been the main focus of, of the literature, but also focusing on what leaders do and how they do that. Uh, so our project leadership model is based on this notion of the incomplete leader, and it has been developed, co-developed uh, in collaboration with uh, BP MBA systems, who have done some executive uh, education work. So this idea accepts that there is no single uh, leader can do everything. They they're not good at everything, uh, and as a result, they need to uh, complement their capabilities with the team. So we, we talk about the notion of incomplete leader, complete team. So what I want to do for this uh, next part is just take you through that leadership model uh, and some ideas that we have been working on. So our model here capture, captures what effective leaders do along two axes. So we have on the horizontal axis, uh, we call this the enabling axis or the enabling uh, dimensions, we have sense making and relating. So sense making is very much what how leaders and uh, their followers, the complete team, make sense of the world around them. We take the idea of, of Vike's notion of sense making here. And basically what they're asking is what is going on here in the midst, in the flux of events, you know, what is going on here, uh, especially under conditions of perceived uncertainty and complexity. Well, the relating uh, dimension really focuses and stresses the importance of interacting with others who have who may have important information about what's going on in the project, relating to both internal and external stakeholders through inquiring, through advocating, and through connecting. So both relating and sense-making provide the cognitive resources um, that form the basis of deciding what to do and doing it along the action axis, which is the vertical axis here of projecting and creating. So projecting is um, what Daniel Defoe articulates as forward aspirations of the project. Why are we doing this project? Why, um, why is it being done? And it's usually captured through a project mission. And projecting is about convincing, uh, persuading teams, stakeholders to get involved in the project. And creating is about how we're going to deliver on that project mission and we how we're going to design the organization that will ensure that consummate uh, delivery on that mission. That involves sort of innovating, um, 
creating new uh, and better ways of doing things, being more creative in how they uh, solve problems uh, to deliver that project mission. And that's really important if we're thinking about moving towards that, those sustainability transitions and achieving the net zero targets. Um, it's also about designing facets, about making design so choices with regard to both how the temporary organizations is a, going to deliver the project, but also going to design the governance, the commercial uh, interfaces between the owners and the supply side. And at the center of our project leadership model, we have uh, the integrating uh, dimension or capability, which is judging. This um, draws on our perspective of uh, the classical psychological traits uh, of effective leaders, such as the big five, emotional intelligence, um, and experiencing and framing. So really trying to draw out that intuition in making those important judgments. Um, so we have been using this project leadership model within um, project managers that work in complex uh, projects, major projects and programs to be used as a prompt for self-reflections for a number of years now. And we also use it as part of a self-assessment exercise. And what we've been finding repeatedly is that our project managers tend to perceive themselves weaker along that projecting uh, dimension. So we're still in the process of collecting data, of validating the instrument. But what we're really uh, interested in now is focusing on how we can help our project managers to um, enhance that projecting capability. Um, for the sense making, for the relating, and for the creating, we have some sort of tools or tool sets that they can take away. And we have some uh, tool sets which we just started to develop on the projecting side. Um, so uh, although these are initial findings, we think that they offer opportunities for development, development, but we think it's really important to recognize that leadership practice for sustainable transition projects requires the mastering of this art of projecting. So thank you for listening. So a very warm welcome everyone to the John Grill Institute Symposium, Room 2, Collaborative Approaches and Stakeholder Management. So my name is Natalia Sergeyeva. I'm Associate Professor in Project Management from the Bartlett School of Sustainable Construction at UCL. And I'm delighted to be chairing this session. So in this session room, we will have uh, four excellent uh, presentations. Uh, each presentation will be about eight minutes, followed by five minute discussion. So I will be watching the time and notify you if needed. So um, in this session, we will learn a lot about collaborative governance and projects, insights into stakeholder engagement, sustainability, and different perspectives on it, and corruption in infrastructure projects. Okay, and so on this note, I would like to invite the first presenter, Badran Zheryev and his colleagues. And the paper is Polycentric Governance, Stakeholder Engagement and Joint Value Creation in Interorganizational Projects. Great to be here. Hello, everyone. My name is Vedran Zheria, and uh, I, I would like to present part of the work um, that we are currently that I'm engaged with or with several other colleagues, which is on emergent and open systems delivery models that we are currently working on. I mean, it's been part of a several years of research and um, this presentation here is just one one particular part of it. Um, so I've been working on this with uh, with my colleagues Maria Gratias Garcia and Francesco Di Madaloni. And this particular piece is on shared governance and joint value creation for interorganizational projects. So in other words, the kind of intersection between shared governance uh, and how the inclusion of different actors that typically are not uh, part of the core project organization in a delivery sense um, leads to uh, novel and emergent types of um, value being created. So the starting point is just kind of a few building blocks. The first one is the, the idea of projects as temporary interorganizational cooperative settings 
multiple actors, multiple parties get together to deliver on uh, an agreed objective so they can then disband and go and do other things. So this kind of meta-organization concept of, of, of a project. Uh, the second one is the, the project governance discourse and the acknowledgement that uh, there's an increasing number of important stakeholders and actors that need to be taken into consideration um, in, the, uh, in the organizing set, uh, effort and setting of a project. So the idea of shared governance. And then the third one is the idea of joint value creation, which is again the idea that uh, the inclusion of uh, various types of actors will lead um, to, to, sh uh, to shared value creation. So it's very much in line of the discussions on stakeholder engagement and embracing the principle of inclusive, govern inclusive governance. So the problem research question is that, you know, starting from the acknowledgement that, uh, you know, stakeholder theory is um, recognizing the challenge, the dilemma and the problem uh, that is faced uh, in those types of multi-actor, um, multi-party settings uh, between pursuing individual interest by stakeholder group as opposed to joint value creation. So there's this kind of a dilemma happening there. And then uh, the intersection uh, between stakeholder governance as one distinct area of uh, domain of research and practice, and then joint value creation as another one, and then trying to uh, argue for the intersection. Uh, we, we kind of get to the research question of how does a shared form of governance create joint value for participants in inter-organizational project settings? So this is, as I said, based on several years of research uh, that we've looked at, you know, value creation and capture uh, in project delivery settings. And this particular piece is based on one specific project, which is a project uh, by the Dutch Highways and Waterways Agency. It's called Room for the River. We've done quite a lot of interviews uh, and, and, and examined some uh, secondary data and uh, documentation of this project. Uh, so it's a qualitative uh, research approach, uh, inductive and qualitative, and uh, it allowed us to argue for... So what we saw when we spoke to these people and discussing with them is that there was this emergent particular type of governance structure that enabled a value creation that we didn't see in other types of projects. And this was all about uh, what we in this uh, instance, in this iteration of this research, frame as uh, polycentric governance uh, is the inclusion of different types of stakeholders and actors. You wouldn't normally find them in the delivery context of a project uh, into the governance structure uh, that then allows uh, a more inclusive type of value creation and more emerging um, uh, types of value that are being created. So um, the 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 this type of um, um, polycentric governance model is creating value, additional types of value on top of the ones which are de designed and planned for uh, the project, which are based on incorporating stakeholder knowledge and capabilities. So in, uh, making uh, uh, the, the project boundary, project organizational boundary, as it were, extending it so that it includes and it absorbs several other stakeholders that wouldn't normally be part of the uh, delivery, uh, empowering those uh, actors and stakeholders in a way that they can have a say, they can um, influence the decision uh, various types of decisions for the for the project, and then creating these dedicated spaces almost where this type of decision making is uh, possible, as opposed to uh, you know uh, the decisions which are in the core remit of the project organization, which obviously do not have that um, that co creation space allowed for them. Uh, and uh, what we also found is that it is creates, it leverages economies of scope and scale for the project in a way that, you know, if there would be a local community group, for instance, that would come in with a specific interest of a, of a output for the project that would be of a great benefit for that group, and it only comes at a marginal cost for the project, then there would be the governance mechanisms and decision-making uh, processes to accommodate for that uh, type of decision to be absorbed into the project. So these are the types of um, 
things that we saw and we thought, you know, this is really something that's interesting and we should be looking into it more thoroughly. So, um, so these are the types of value creation that are being uh, like the benefits of this type of shared governance model, which is more inclusive um, than, than the kind of traditional um, uh, um, type of governance. Uh, which, however, also creates difficulties. And of course, it's, you know, obviously, the more actors are being included in the governance structure and in the decision making, it creates um, frictions. You know, different actors are brought in with different agendas, and there will need to be obviously a compromise, uh, a consensus before uh, the next step can be taken, which creates a lot of difficulty. So there is a need for compromise and coordination, and there is a need for uh, organizations. Uh, here we are thinking typically of the client organization to develop capabilities that allow this type of integration of knowledge and inclusive uh, shared governance model, which obviously creates uh, difficulties in its own right. Uh, and then the second part of it is that, uh, and we didn't find that from the data, this is just kind of us hypothesizing that it would involve a certain type of shared and distributed leadership models to allow for these um, uh, various groups of stakeholders to be involved in the shared governance model uh, and uh, develop delivery systems which are uh, more inclusive and uh, more effective ultimately for for all of their participants so so this is the 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 little piece of our broader area of research uh, that i wanted to discuss uh, today it's very much work in progress currently we are looking for angles for conceptual and theoretical angles to frame the phenomenon that we think is is worthwhile um pointing out and so any comments any questions any uh ideas that would help us in this uh, endeavor would be much appreciated. Thank you very much. I would like to invite a second presenter, uh, Luca Sabini from the University of Leeds and his colleagues. And his paper is Sustainability in the Making, an ethnographic study. Thanks a lot for, uh, for inviting me to, to, present, uh, to present this work. Uh, that uh, uh, done with together with the Daniel Muzio and, and Stuart Clegg, which is also in uh, here uh, among us. Um, my name is Luca Sabini. I'm from the University of Leeds, and here are my contacts if you want, would like to, to get in touch. So I go very very quickly, uh, as for the time's sake, through the uh, through the key points. So uh, the ideas for uh, the, the key idea of the study is that. Starting from the concept of sustainability or sustainable development, which is very, very clear uh, in, in abstract terms, um, what um, actually when uh, we try to translate or to contextualize or enact uh, this, this abstract concept in practice, uh, that's, uh, that is a different story. It's not, it's not so clear how this is enacted and every uh, endeavor uh, is, is different. Every uh, kind of project trying to, to achieve sustainable objectives uh, takes uh, different shapes and ways to, to, to achieve it. Um, moreover, I'm focusing on the, uh, on, on the construction interest in particular, because it's been a, a, a quite difficult this, this shift toward a more uh, sustainable way of conduct, conducting this, uh, uh, this, uh, um, this kind of businesses. Uh, there are standard guidelines, but very often those are not com com widely shared or coherently implemented. So what we are looking at here is the interaction uh, among um, the different understanding of sustainability. So how different stakeholders understand sustainability in, in different ways, how they negotiate those understanding, and how uh, the strategy to, to manage tension arising from, uh, from, uh, from these different understandings uh, happen uh, through through the, uh, the project phases. So to do so, we combine uh, studies on uh, sustainability, understanding, negotiated order, and trade-off and organizational tensions. So going straight to the to the research question uh, uh, guiding this uh, uh, this uh, this research is how sustainability is enacted in a project setting. To answer this this question, we uh, looked at uh, uh, we we developed an ethnographic case. Uh, um, so in the back of this uh, of this picture, you can see there's a building. Uh, we followed all the, the process of constructing this building from the early on 
um, phases, preliminary phases to, to when the building was open. And this is based in, in Newcastle, UK, so in north of England, um, and is uh, um, owned and built by the Newcastle University. So um, we developed this case and uh, very, very briefly, I, I will give you some of, of the ex some uh, examples of things that we found. Um, to, 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 to describe uh, what was happening uh, around, the, uh, around sustainability, we divided by the, the common uh, project uh, life cycle phases. And um, we have seen that in each of these phases, there is a different story on how sustainability is, is considered and is, is enacted. So for example, in the, in the beginning, the preparation and brief, uh, the main output of this phase was the uh, uh, drafting a master plan. So basically this document that says what, to, what is done with the, with the land uh, before even the building, uh, is, uh, uh, the building starts. And here we, we see different, uh, uh, different uh, um, uh, stakeholders, different actors. So there's the, the city council, uh, the Newcastle University and, and uh, um, the European Regional Development Fund. They bought, they bought the land and then they had to decide what to do with this land. Uh, there was this general idea of uh, this uh, sustainable urban development, but no one has uh, had you know, a clear idea what, what it was. Uh, every, every actor had different uh, 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 consideration of what sustainability was for them. Uh, Newcastle University was looking to attract uh, uh, external funding from uh, uh, grants. The city council wanted to avoid, uh, uh, since the, this land is very close to the center, so wanted to avoid urban degradation. So every actor had different ideas and uh, they had to negotiate these ideas toward the, the implementation of, of, the, of the master plan. Um, different stories in the design of the building, where here uh, there are mainly the architects trying to understand the requirements from the university top management, the, 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 the academics, so the users that were going to be living in the building. Uh, and here was about which, uh, which kind of sustainability objective uh, uh, we want to prioritize. One example was, for, uh, for instance, um, which kind of standard do we do we use for the construction? So the top management was keen to adopt a commercial standards that they could easily uh, sell and demonstrate how sustainability was achieved, the BREEAM standard, um, while the, uh, the, the, the academics wanted to develop a best book, a, a framework uh, that was you know, adapted to their needs. Uh, and those are this kind of negotiation that happened in, in, in the design phase. I'm just going to stop here and not giving all, all, all the picture for the time's sake, but if you want, uh, you know, we can discuss this later in more in depth. So what are the, the, main, the main findings, what we found, how sustainability was enacted in, in the different phases? So um, we found that for each phase, given the, 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 the deliverable, given the main uh, 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 focus of, of the phase, the, and the, the actors taking part to, to, to deliver, uh, this, this part of the project, the, the discussion and the negotiation around sustainability were very different. So in the first phase, we, we call it visioning sustainability. And this is the, the process of enacting sustainability when a negotiation lead to consolidate different understanding. Uh, here, the main output is a very high level abstract document, which allow the different tensions, the different understanding of sustainability to, to be synthesized into into one document. So you, if you can, if you look at the at the picture at the bottom left, now there are the three different actors that consolidate their understanding in one document. They have ideas on you know main guidelines uh, or main um, uh, a vision, a general general vision of what sustainability, which kind of sustainability they want, and they just you know bring it together because it's uh, uh, the, the the type of deliver allow to to synthesize them. Different, pro um, different stories in the design. Um, the process of enacting sustainability in this step is called designing sustainability. And here, uh, what we've seen, given that the deliverable is much more detailed, you know, uh, here we have the architecture and technical design of the building. So uh, they are very detailed and precise. Uh, it is a very detailed and precise document. Um, here, what is happening is a collage of different understanding. By collage means that this uh, different understanding may um, uh, no, no, not necessarily overlap one with the other. They can be, uh, um, you know, tangent or even uh, completely different. But um, because of the deliverables uh, is so 
specific um, is not possible to, to consolidate uh, uh, this different understanding of what was happening in the previous phase. So the, the way to manage this, this tension is to, to separate, you not know, to, to, to split. Uh, uh, um, and uh, just an example of separation was uh, uh, when we have these different standards of construction, the commercial and the best book standard, uh, uh, what was happening is there, uh, the responsibility for this different standard was assigned to different teams. And those teams, even if they were pursuing opposing uh, uh, um, uh, um, objectives, which was one standard was uh, um, pursuing different objectives than another, uh, they, they keep the, this, this, para this tension open, this paradoxical situation where they do uh, opposing uh, uh, objectives at the same time. Um, and we found that you know it is different story in, in each in each phase. Again, I'm going to stop in the in the design. So uh, just to to conclude, so what what are the the key findings and the, uh, the, our contribution in, into this? So uh, the process of enacting sustainability is different for any endeavor, but what we we see is that sustainability is happens as a as a process of uh, negotiation among stakeholders. So the first contribution that we have is that. Sustainability is, uh, is, is, is considered as a dynamic concept. Uh, cannot, uh, is, is not um, worth to define a priori what, which kind of sustainability we want, because then it is negotiated anyway through the project phases, and then it changes its shape. So that is our first main contribution. And the second one is that um, different understanding leads to tensions, and the tensions are managed uh, uh, through um, different type of strategies. Uh, this is well known in the, in, in sustainability uh, 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 literature, um, how to manage uh, um, paradoxical situation where you have opposing objectives. But what we add to this is to connect, to link uh, um, the, 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 the strategy to manage tension with the, the type of uh, the source of the tension. So the deliverable in this case, how, uh, for example, in the, the, in, the, in the first part of the project where we have a very high level abstract uh, uh, deliverable, um, we, we can synthesize uh, uh, the, those different understanding and synthesize the tension in one document. This is not the case when instead we have a very detailed document where we, we can't adopt the synthesis strategy, but uh, our other strategies are more appropriate, such as we have seen uh, uh, opposition uh, uh, or separation of strategy. So these are the, uh, the, the main findings. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I haven't kept time uh, kept track of time, so I'm sorry if I ran over the, the eight minutes. And again, my, my contacts if you wish to, to get in touch. Thanks a lot. And I would like to invite third presenter, Daniel Hall, and from TU Delft University of Technology. I'm here to present uh, the work that I've done along with uh, Dr. Marcella Bonanomi on governing collaborative project delivery as a common pool resource scenario. I think it's a nice uh, uh, kind of move from Bedron's work to here. And uh, I'm going to present our conceptual model and the illustrations, uh, a couple of short illustrations from, from practice. I will say that in talking about collaborative project delivery, um, of course, we, we know there are many types, um, you know, alliancing, partnering. A lot of my experiences and a lot of this conceptualization comes from my experience um, in North America with the the project delivery type of integrated project delivery. And this is also often used for procurement of uh, complex buildings, uh, but not necessarily infrastructure. So these are a couple of important contexts to keep in mind. But when we look at the difference between these collaborative types uh, of project delivery versus uh, traditional project delivery models, I try to summarize it as having three distinct differences between the two. And the first one is that uh, especially with integrated project delivery, the multi-party contract creates a shared financial pool. Um, and the literature often explains these as profit pools or common pools or contingency pools. Uh, the second is that the project uh, creates a shared decision-making rights structure over the entire project direction. So this is an example from a project I worked on, a, a $2 billion um, hospital project in San Francisco. Uh, which I studied as part of my PhD. And here you have the what they call the big room meeting. So they have uh, multiple stakeholders from different companies delivering the project, all meeting together. Um, and in theory, there's a pluralistic uh, governance structure and enforced by the contract that allows everyone to have some say in the shared decision-making rights. Um, and this is because there's a shared and re risk, uh, reward that's given to the project's participants. Um, in in the, the case I just ex explained, there was eight uh, parties, but I've seen as many as 17 parties 
that will um, that will sign a, a single multi-party contract. Um, and importantly, they are pooling the resources of the owner, and then they are saying within this pooled uh, resources, we we have agreements around uh, profit pooling and incentives. And they also have others that are outside of the shared resource pool, and these are uh, you know traditional contracts, dyadic contracts between uh, parties. Okay, so this is the setting in which we find that integrated project delivery and other collaborative project delivery models um, exist. Uh, and what I found in my experience was that there was a problem uh, is that I felt that the, the IPD and the other collaborative project delivery literature has an overemphasis on practices and uh, mechanisms. So a lot of the literature, especially in my domain, which is kind of management of engineering construction projects, um, looks at it's kind of, okay, here are the practices of IPD and here are the mechanisms. So we have a big room, we have a joint decision-making, we have shared uh, risk and reward. Um, but, and this is, I think, very useful. I don't want to, to um, you know, say that uh, practice-based approach doesn't have its place. But the trouble is that I lacked or I didn't find that we had some type of overarching theory or conceptualization of what was really happening. Um, we found that these projects were very successful and there's a number of uh, field reports showing their success, um, yet we don't really uh, have a higher level conceptualization. Um, and uh, so I was able to find that actually inspired a lot by the work of Nuno Gill um, to thinking about uh, these projects um, and conceptualizing can conceptualizing their governance as a common pool resource scenario. Um, now this picture is appropriate. I spent the last five years of my life living in Switzerland, and maybe you're familiar with the phrase, the tragedy of the commons. In this case, the, the pasture is open to all and everyone receives the benefit for their own an animals that might be herding grass, but there is a, a delayed cost of deterioration. And uh, then if you're rationally acting, in theory, then you would then be incentivized to add more, more animals, to, you know, keep overgrazing until the overall ecosystem goes down. And uh, from this starting point, I began to wonder, is it also true that we have, uh, for example, the, the, the problem of a tragedy of a project, especially in these collaborative projects? We've now, in theory and, con and also contractually, opened up the budget and the schedule to all participants on the construction project, and they're going to receive a, a benefit because they, they're guaranteed to have direct cost reimbursements. Um, but there could be a delayed cost if the project is kind of overall not uh, not performing uh, and then everyone will lose their profit that's been put at risk. And so uh, you have you could have a downward spiral of project resources uh, or the tragedy of the project. Um, now, fortunately, uh, if you, you're familiar with the tragedy of the commons, you may not what you may not know is that actually the tragedy is kind of an imagined tragedy. There was a recent paper that called the tragedy of, of commons bullshit, uh, excuse my language. But, uh, you know, essentially, the, the, if you read that paper, the conclusion is that you need then therefore a centralized entity to take control because the, the commoners are not uh, are not able to kind of manage themselves. Um, but then Eleanor Ostrom came along uh, and won the Nobel Prize by saying that, no, actually, local actors are the best uh, in a decentralized approach uh, to manage the commons. And she developed uh, eight design principles. I do not have time to go through all of them, but I will mention quickly the two of them, um, in which is the best way to manage a common pool resource scenario. Um, and so what we do in our conceptual paper is we just uh, highlight the, the, the connections between these two, right? So uh, how in practice, how are these practices that we find on these IPD projects related to the best principles of, uh, of common pool resource governance for long enduring uh, um, common pool resource scenarios? So for example, the first design principle is that we must clearly define the boundaries of the common pool resource. It actually goes against what Fedrin was just explaining about opening up, uh, but uh, they're, they're kind of clearly saying that you are in on the project project delivery team and you are out. Um, and they do this also uh, defining the boundaries of the resources. So they say how much budget and, uh, and schedule time is available through a, a practice called the validation study. And we just don't have time to get into it, but this is where the, the, the team co-defines everything. Now we had a theoretical approach. Uh, we wrote the, the conceptual paper, um, but at the same time, we also wanted to see how this would played out in practice. So Dr. Bononomi spent uh, several months visiting the uh, Canada where she looked at the East Vancouver Integrated Health and Social Housing Project. It actually was the first uh, integrated project delivery project in Canada that was delivered with a public client. Um, and uh, she conducted uh, 81 hours of observations and uh, many uh, interviews. I won't get into the details there. Uh, but I think this quote, I think, really emphasizes the overall uh, mindset of the participants as a, as a collective community. 
um, a, a trade contractor, uh, you know, normally the lower end of the, of the hierarchy says, it's great that we're at the table with everyone, the owners, the consultants, et cetera. There is no hierarchy anymore. Everyone is equally respected. There is, however, a lot of stress concerning the shared risk aspect. I'm used to putting myself and my company at risk, but not used to putting all the other groups involved at risk. And at the same time, it drives accountability. Um, and what, we're, what we've done is we've kind of looked at how specific uh, practices that, that occur there are related to the best practices uh, and design rules of common pool resources. I'll give another very short example here, um, the principle of monitoring. So Ostrom says that monitors should be present and actively be auditing the resource conditions. And those monitors should either be the users themselves, the participants, or they should be accountable to the user. So it's not a, hier a, a hierarchy that's monitoring, but it's, it's coming from the bottom up. And we saw this here on the project where we had a weekly review of each uh, project team reporting um, a, a metric called the planned percent complete. What they had to do is they had to write it at the top of their, of their board here. So they had to uh, you know, specifically say, here was the percent that we have completed. I think it's also interesting that this was actually a representative team of the owner. So again, you have the owner who's of the project, the, the sponsor, uh, who is also accountable himself uh, or herself to the, to the, the, the rest of the users. And then you have a weekly meeting where everyone will report out the, the you know, and having a kind of social form of, of monitoring and, and then eventually maybe even sanctioning. So finally, I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, this allows, what we think this allows to guide future project managers to design the governance um, uh, practices of the future. Uh, today, you kind of copy and paste from previous projects and you think about different practices and mechanisms. But if we can reframe our thinking to say that we need to uh, design governance mechanisms that are um, enabling the common pool resource uh, design principles, we can then now imagine future ideas, um, uh, future ways of, of governing our projects. Um, and just as a short example, we are also doing a bit of work now on, on uh, with blockchain about project delivery on the crypto commons, and we're using Ostrom's principles as some of our guiding uh, uh, um, principles to, uh, to, to come up with this. Um, these practices. So that's all for me. Uh, thank you very much. These are the three papers uh, which I, I've referred to. And um, yeah, very happy for your questions. Okay, now I would like to invite our next presenter, Tristana Sainati from University of Leeds. Yeah. And his colleagues. Thank you very much uh, also for the support. So uh, my name is Tristano Sainati and uh, I am presenting uh, um, uh, this research about code of conducts. Uh, so all the other uh, participants of this research, uh, Nermi Armando Castro and Jackie Glass from UCL, uh, Giorgio Locatelli and Giacomo Dei from Politecnico and then myself from University of Leeds. And this research is about uh, code of conducts to tackle uh, anti-corruption. So the, the problem we are trying to solve is uh, corruption in infrastructure projects. So there is a, a very huge uh, body of literature of uh, how problematic is uh, this issue um, uh, for projects and for um, uh, the associated uh, economy and society. And uh, among the different uh, formal instruments that can be used to tackle uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this problem, uh, there is uh, the so-called code of conduct that is uh, a formal instrument is like a, 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 an organizational policy um, that is implemented. Uh, so, uh, and so this is the idea of code of conduct uh, to tackle um, a corruption. This research, uh, actually, uh, uh, to do it, uh, we um, assessed uh, these um, code of conducts in uh, sixteen companies, uh, the largest construction companies. Uh, we identified at the outset. Uh, different rankings to, uh, to really uh, consider the largest companies. And they are mainly from the US and uh, Europe. You can see the right hand, um, on the right hand side, the list of the companies we have considered. And uh, uh, we assess on this uh, uh, code of conducts. Uh, um, we uh, implemented the thematic analysis and uh, we started with uh, a, a protocol based on, on some a few pilot uh, 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 um, uh, codes, and then uh, as soon as we um, um, clean up this and we reorganize properly, we applied uh, this uh, to all the remaining code of conducts. Uh, this was uh, really 
uh, an inductive approach uh, when it comes to thematic analysis and we apply the proper coding uh, on the different uh, codes. Most of the time, the organizations have uh, uh, either one or multiple uh, code of conducts. Because our research was on corruption, we uh, either uh, focus on the general code of conduct that sometimes enclose the, corru the corruption principles, or we consider and uh, the, the thing I want to mention is that uh, uh, of, uh, among the different malpractice covered by the Code of Conduct, corruption is the ones uh, uh, overemphasized. And uh, sometimes companies uh, have uh, the general Code of Conduct plus the bespoke corruption Code of Conduct. And generally, uh, all of these companies analyzed are multinationals. So they have uh, this Code of Conduct at group level. And uh, uh, we coded uh, uh, the different definitions and example, and uh, uh, as well as remedies. Uh, um, and you can see here the typical remedies identified by, by the code of conduct when it range from due diligence, vigilance, uh, vigilance, and other precautions. And we also started with uh, a coding on different uh, uh, malpractices. So we, we cover also other uh, malpractices, but uh, what I'm going to present today is mainly about uh, 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 corruption. So I'm going to ask you to move next, please. And uh, I think this is probably the most uh, relevant um, uh, thing I would like to emphasize as part of this research. So. Um, Many of the principles and definitions and, and examples were kind of common, uh, but uh, we um, I'm presenting now what uh, it seems to be the probably the most relevant message out of this research and uh, the more um, counterintuitive and controversial aspects of this research. So uh, uh, firstly, that most anti-corruption principles are rather aspirational and not directly enforceable. And uh, so uh, uh, big sections in, in, uh, in this code of conduct uh, are aspirational in the sense that they just mentioned that uh, the group uh, and the organization is against corruption. And, uh, and uh, that alone is not uh, very useful to actually implement any, any specific procedure or principle that is directly legally enforceable. Uh, so uh, that is the first uh, comment. Uh, we kind of expected something like that. Uh, but there are also some in, uh, enforceable elements. The second uh, point uh, is that uh, um, uh, auditing and reporting is mainly internal. And that gives us really the impressions that uh, uh, those companies mainly focus on the reputational damage rather than uh, uh, exposing in a way themselves uh, also to independent uh, uh, kind of uh, um, organizations to assess uh, or, or um, or departments within the organizations to assess uh, the issue of uh, anti-corruption. And very often, and that is for us a little bit controversial, uh, the main uh, point uh, of uh, to report uh, issues uh, of uh, when it comes to corruption is the line manager. So you would expect the line manager uh, uh, and the employee that goes directly to the line manager, maybe to uh, you know, discuss something like a bribe, and probably the line manager will be involved. So um, also this idea of maybe jump some of the management level is not fully implemented. And we, we thought that, that was um, a problem. Thirdly, uh, whistleblower have uh, their identity protected. So this is very important. However, uh, in some instances, we have uh, the feeling that there is not clearly how that is enforced, particularly in, the, in those situations when the employees report directly to their line manager. So uh, probably the line manager would distinguish them. So their identity wouldn't be protected. So fourth, in principle, most of uh, code of conducts would prohibit any retaliation against whistleblowers. And uh, so this is a <clears throat> uh, another principle. Uh, some some organization express how uh, and, uh, and they make sure that they, they have in, in place some of the processes to protect uh, their identity. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, this uh, fourth principle is much more credible. Other organizations uh, are not when, uh, the ones that uh, report directly to the line manager, for example. And therefore, we are puzzled uh, how this is actually uh, implemented. And fifthly, um, uh, facilitation payment is sometimes tolerated. So this is uh, like a gray area uh, kind of connected to corruption uh, because uh, uh, there is an express uh, mentioning about uh, 
paying ransom in, and then prioritizing, for instance, the security of the employees if they are kidnapped, for example, uh, and uh, and uh, and that could be open the gates to potential types of uh, corruptions in a way. So that is kind of uh, controversial because some companies really mention that as a as a, a way to uh, circumvent the typical uh, uh, barriers to uh, these uh, gray payments. Other organizations instead uh, they are very strict and against. Uh, 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 any type of facilitation payment. So this is a, an interesting, uh, perhaps controversial point. I'm uh, I'm finishing with the eight minutes. I just want to mention in the end that, that this uh, kind of project in, uh, a, in, is funded by the PMI and uh, is uh, intending to inform the code of conducts at project level for 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 projects. So we are trying to develop a proper a code of conduct standard for uh, the construction industry in general. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, everyone. And yes, see you all in room in much. session four. Hello, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this international symposium. I'm Mahshi Tutunchi, lecturer at the School of Project Management, New York, Sydney. I would like to acknowledge the people of Yugera as I am in Brisbane. Please uh, feel free to participate and use the chat to ask questions. The focus of this session is on projects as interventions to achieve net zero. Coping with climate changes requires dynamic planning for efficient use of existing infrastructure, smart integration of, integration of new technology and balancing economic growth with social sustainability. Projects as sudden or modular interventions um, facilitate the optimization of supply chains and operations planning. I would like to introduce our three distinguished speakers. Our first valued speaker is Professor Giorgio Lucatelli from Polytechnic University of Milan, Italy. Uh, Giorgio, thank you so much for joining us. Would you mind to introduce uh, your research? Uh, research? Yes, thank you very much. Mashid for uh, the invitation and organizing uh, this, really appreciated. My name is Giorgio Locatelli, I'm a full professor of complex project business uh, in the Politecnico di Milano. My interest uh, is uh, toward uh, net zero and uh, the role played by infrastructure and project uh, in uh, net zero. I'm looking at this uh, with uh, my PhD student, Marco Terenzi, which is also in the room and people is welcome to connect with him. And uh, we are very pleased to be here today. Thank you so much. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here. Our second valued speaker is Professor Ali Abbas, head of the School of Chemical Engineering, University of Sydney. Uh, Ali, it's our great pleasure to have you here. Would you mind to uh, introduce your recent work? Hi, Mashid, and good Hi. evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ali Abbas. I'm the acting head of School of Chemical Engineering at the University of Sydney. And I work in an area that is called process systems engineering, where I apply systems thinking to solving uh, problems in the domains of uh, clean energy, low emissions technologies, and also um, circular economy. I'm very pleased to be with you today. Thank you so much. It's an honor for us. And our uh, third speaker is Professor Daniel Armanius from Safe Business School, University of Oxford, UK. Uh, Daniel, it's a great pleasure for us to have you today. Would you mind to introduce your recent research? Uh, thanks, Ashid, and a pleasure to join you all and be amongst these distinguished thanks. panelists. Um, I'm the BT Professor of Major Program Management at Said Business School. It's the best way to understand my research. It's uh, civil engineering meets organizational sociology. So I'm interested in how organizations interact to underpin various systems ranging from innovation systems all the way to broadband and water and how that works amidst uh, complexity and uh, disruptions that we will increasingly face in the future, of which one of them is environmental and climate change. Thank you so much. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Giorgio, considering the limited time frame for reduction of emissions by 2030, how do you think that projects can act as interventions to achieve net zero? Yes, I think uh, that the projects are a vector of change. 
not agent of change because the agent are people. So project are vector of change. And there is no such things as a net zero project because when we do a project, we have a, a contribution in terms of CO2. However, what I think is that the project can transform asset that emit CO2. And basically project I think that can do two, four different things. One is to create a new asset. So for instance, replace a coal power plant with wind. They can upgrade existing asset. So for instance, uh, all the work done in housing retrofitting or in general building retrofitting, this is an example of upgrading existing asset, or they can have intangible outcomes. So for instance, how we use the asset, convince people to decrease the temperature in the home and put a jumper instead of uh, turning the heating on. And lastly, the last category is R&D project. So project to develop asset that in the future will reduce uh, CO2 emission, for instance, developing a uh, fusion uh, project. So project can change the asset or even better can change the portfolio of asset. And we can apply this to different uh, sectors. So let's, let's make an example. Uh, let's think about the aerospace sector, which belongs to transportation, which is a relevant contributor to CO2 emission. So in this case, a project can do two things. So one, we can have a project to reduce intensity. So the idea that we have uh, aircraft which are more efficient for the same amount of kilometer travel, we have less CO2 emission. This can be an R&D project. Or, and that's the second axis, uh, we can reduce quantity. So reduce the number of kilometers that people have to travel. And uh, this can be done, for instance, through behavioral change project, as we did uh, historically for smoking. So we have a project to reduce uh, smoking. We can have a project to reduce the quantity of uh, miles that are flight every year by people. So these are my idea of how project can be intervention and vector of change toward net zero. Fantastic uh, points, and it uh, drives my mind to Ali's recent research. Ali, how do you um, evaluate integration of existing projects with, um, I mean, brown and green fields? It's very hard to integrate the new technologies to the existing one, uh, considering different aspects of projects. Yeah, that, that is an important aspect of projects. I guess I, I start off in my thinking about projects using the systems approach, the systems thinking. That's kind of a basis for all sorts of ways of dealing with um, net zero problems, circular economy problems, and other systems um, as well. Um, so this systems that thinking approach can be um, used to tackle um, industrial projects, uh, especially when we think about scale. I think it's important always to understand the, the scale and many of these projects uh, that I work with are larger scale, sometimes mega projects, and trying to understand how they play out in terms of the environmental impact is quite important for me and for our research. So we often focus on the uh, emissions uh, aspects of these projects and the emissions related to the output from these projects. So industrial ecology for us is, is um, one of those areas that we have um, in the last few years been focusing on, trying to extend beyond the existing body of knowledge of industrial ecology, symbi industrial symbiosis, and trying to think about that scale I'm talking about and how we can integrate plants together, manufacturing plants that is, uh, because what we've discovered through the research that the future for net zero is going to see less and less uh, operation at standalone level, meaning that uh, plants or manufacturing facilities that work alone will not survive in the future. So this symbiosis between plants becomes extremely um, a necessity for uh, profitability, but also for achieving uh, quite significant uh, emissions reductions. Industrial systems, if they are integrated together, uh, and if we have the opportunity, and I'm coming back to your question, Manshid, about greenfield versus brownfield, if we have that opportunity to start with a greenfield um, design of such operations, we can capture and leapfrog significant uh, emissions mitigations. 
And that is because waste from uh, one operator can become the resource and feedstock for the other operator. Our research has shown significant emissions reductions if this is done via um, computational methods, via smart ways to design. And of, of course, you can then move into the smart way to operate these facilities. And that's kind of the intervention I, I try to uh, make using that systems thinking, that scale, the integration through industrial ecology and um, monitoring and accounting the emissions uh, all the way uh, in all those steps. And uh, thank you so much. Do you think that the same system thinking applies to circular economies, especially their effects in sustainable systems? The transition to circular economy systems and, and circular economy project is, is, um, is, is harder, is more difficult. There are many reasons why that is. We can, at the moment, begin to think about the circular economy or the true circular economy, um, which uh, looks at designing or eliminating out waste completely and um, also keeping the resources um, in circulation in the economy for uh, longer. So those kind of principles, as well as the regeneration principle, all of those principles are now being worked on by many researchers around the world trying to understand how to measure the impact of the circular economy. And so it is still unclear to many um, how that impact will, will play out in the circular economy projects. However, what we want to move forward is beyond these kind of metrics around the diversion from landfill, for example, that traditional metric. We want to start moving into circularity metrics and starting to design around those, what I call the circular economic metrics and objectives. Once we understand that a little bit more, and that's happening, we, we can begin to um, create that circular economy uh, intervention uh, in projects. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, Daniel, uh, my question in regards to your recent research is in terms of different scenarios that projects can run to achieve net zeros. Uh, how do you evaluate those different scenarios, considering uh, what Giorgio mentioned about um, uh, the projects for net zero and what Ali mentioned about integration of greenfield and brownfield? Uh, your research directs these two conversations. Yeah, thanks, Masha, for that for that question around scenarios. I think. Um, I think the way I think of it around scenarios is, is thinking around what the scenario is trying to instill. So I kind of think of kind of three things at, at the moment, um, especially as they relate to net zero. One is kind of scenarios around new technology, either for delivery or facilitating new thinking. And I'll get into that in a minute. Second is new organizing norms. What is these new kind of future scenarios around environment going to require in terms of organizing even a project? And then third, the scenarios, are we paying attention to marginalization, new stakeholders? So to kind of quickly get into this, if you look at new technologies on the delivery side, you're seeing a rapid increase in automation uh, and printing. So for example, right now, uh, the Chinese are, are proposing the Yangchu Dam, which they plan to 3D print in two years. And it'll build the largest 3D printing machine that we've seen. And if we see that trajectory go forward, where machines are printing out your technologies, there's scenarios now where you could automate repairs because the machine has developed where the screw is, where the bolt is, et cetera. But it also uh, makes us even have to be more acute to bias, to attending to bias. And we can get into that later in the discussion. On new technologies around kind of um, thinking about how do, how do we think in this new kind of future world around net zero, I think what's fascinating about major projects, major programs is the notion of comp collapse time scales. So we have to have emissions by 2030. We have to hit net zero by 2050. The average major project takes 5, 10, even upwards 15 years. So essentially what that means is whatever project is being conceived now has to develop immediately at least half emissions right away, just from the, from the, from the deployment. Now, the challenge with that is we know that the climate's warming. We know that there's more climate change, but it's also more unpredictable. It's more torrential rain, more infrequent kind of temperature changes. And so now you're asking 
a major major project manager to anticipate what is flooding going to look like on my bridge 10 years from now, five years from now? What is uh, temperature going to do to my server management system for my cloud computing? Right. So how do you kind of build that? That's now bringing a whole line of technologies that we see around augmented reality, virtual reality to at least give people the best possible scenarios we have and then try to think how can that help maybe develop anticipatory heuristics? I think it's an exciting area of research and I think it's uh, it's still really early um, in terms of new organizing norms. I think what net zero particularly is requiring is we think more distributed and not mega now. Why do I say this? Um, let's just take a couple of examples. Let's look at cement. Cement is 8% of global emissions. There's different grades. There's different needs of cement, different porosity, different reinforcement. And all of these are around a whole portfolio of projects. It's not just one centralized project that's running a lot of uh, cement, let's say. Transportation, 24% of our, of our global CO2 emissions. Again, very distributed hub and spoke. High-speed rail in the UK is going to look very different than Australia. It's going to look very different than in, in, in Rwanda. And I think what we're dealing with then is not a convening site of a bunch of centralized mega projects, but a distributed portfolio of projects. And I don't think we really have good frameworks to understand major programs as portfolios as opposed to centralized mega projects. Um, and that requires replicating means as opposed to the ends. It requires situating those methods in different locations. And then the final one, I would say, we need to have scenarios that include historically marginalized stakeholders. So if we're thinking of, of improving not just the delivery outcomes of major programs, but their resilience to environmental change and, and ways to get net zero, we now have to start thinking about strengthening our most vulnerable populations because they're the, the first and foremost that are going to be hitting the front lines of climate change. And we need to be able to equip them to be able to handle those immediately on site as opposed to waiting for the, for the disruption to propagate. And that requires really new thinking about how we co-design and co-govern major projects or mega projects, whatever term you want to use, with marginalized communities that are often experiencing the brunt of the environmental degradation immediately. And it also gives us kind of an early warning system of how to rethink risk, rethink our deployment of projects in light of those marginalizations. So just to summarize, we need scenarios that incorporate new technology at delivery, as well as facilitate new anticipatory thinking in an uncertain future. Second, new organizational norms that are thinking of projects more distributed as opposed to centralized mega projects. And then also these scenarios need to include new stakeholders we haven't included historically. Fantastic. Um, considering this multi-objective nature of net zero projects, assessing risk would be really challenging. And um, something that I uh, got from your paper is environmental interruption as a possible risk. So uh, because these scenarios should be dynamic live, do you see um, uh, the role of AI in future scenario planning for net zero projects? Uh, yes, I do. I do. Whether we like it or not, it is going to become much more ubiquitous. We're seeing algorithms right now developing all sorts of decision making. I mean, I even heard, won't mention the company, even AI is now deciding bonuses for managers automatically without any human intervention. Um, I think there's a couple of things we have to keep in mind. One is if we understand how these algorithms work with assessing risk, we may have to think of it more processually. I know Jennifer Wyatt, Andrew Davies, Nuno have all been doing these kind of things, thinking not just at the planning phase, but through the whole process. The other key thing is thinking about um, how risk propagates. So usually we think about it from the single project, but if they're interconnected portfolios now, you have to think if risk accumulates in one project, it's going to propagate into another. So even thinking of kind of risk propagation methods and how to do it, but also attending to the bias. I mean, if, especially when we're dealing with marginalization, we historically don't have data on those kind of communities. And if we're using AI to assess risk on a, essentially an out sample, there's a lot of danger with that if you're if it's not grounded in the same arena as the training data. So I think it, re, it, it presents really interesting, cool opportunities, but also some really um, important biases and harms that we have to be attentive to even more acutely than we are historically. Fantastic point. Uh, and again, another risk that I love to read in Georgia's uh, paper was assessing con consumer behavior in our planning. I can see that you foresee this 
changes in consumer behavior affecting our planning for net zero? Would you mind to explain more? Yes. Uh, firstly, we have to understand that there is a, a new idea, a new framework to look at uh, consumer behavior and how consumer behavior shapes infrastructure and shapes project. This is called a system of provision. Is something that has been developed by unorthodox econom economics and is truly interesting to see this from a project management point of view. And I can make a simple example, okay? So I am based in the north of Italy. Uh, north of Italy during winter is quite cold. We have to eat uh, our house, okay? Now, if we decrease by one degree the indoor house temperature, we can save 3.5% of national uh, gas consumption in Italy, natural gas consumption in Italy, which is a lot because Italy uses a lot of natural gas to make electricity. Now, so if you decrease by three, de three degree, you, you cut, uh, CO, you cut uh, uh, natural gas consumption by 10%. Decrease three degree temperature at home means to convince people to put the jumper on. Okay, so an extra layer, that's it, no technology, and this pain me to say because I'm a mechanical engineer by background. So the big question for me is how, can, which kind of project can we do to convince people to reduce a bit the temperature at home and put an extra layer on them? Okay, and I feel that is missing a chapter in our uh, project management book. So if I look at the books that I used to teach my students, they speak about infrastructure, they speak about the scope management, they skip all about this, but I see that there is a kind of bias toward the hard project to build an house, a retrofitting or whatever. So what we want to look at is what I call intangible project. So decrease the temperature, I'll convince people to decrease the temperature at home, I have convinced people to fly less and so far and so forth. And so when we look at this, we have a new kind of, for instance, innovation. And it's not the traditional innovation that comes uh, into place when you discuss nuclear power plant. That was my, it's been my topic for 15 years now. Because there is no test to run. There is no material to qualify or something like that. And this is super important. And the last point they want to make of this is that this need to fit in a bigger scheme that we believe is the national decarbonization portfolio of project. That, of course, incl include hard and traditional project replace coal with wind or nuclear, okay? Sure, but uh, it's far more than that. And this layer of complexity that mix a mega project, building wind farm and nuclear power plant with a super simple project convincing people to uh, isolate the roof uh, or decrease the temperature at home, create uh, a network of complexity and the network of incentive between stakeholders, which is incredibly complex, but also incredibly interesting to research. Amazing point. Uh, uh, we really have to consider different type of projects. Ali, there is a question that has been raised, and I guess it's very relevant to your work. When we talk about net zero, uh, generally we think about solar panels and you know wind power, very uh, clear, clean, and peaceful. Uh, what other sources of um, energy would you consider, and what other type of projects to achieve net zero shall be considered besides just the clean electrical power? Yes, Mashi. I guess the point that you raise here is important and I'm very happy to share some of the insights from our research on solar panels. We look at solar, solar panels as a renewable green uh, um, technology that can solve a lot of the um, problems around um, energy and the energy transition for net zero. However, it is starting to emerge more and more and becoming common conversation that there is this energy and material uh, nexus. So we cannot just solve the problem by looking at uh, the transition or the energy transition problem by looking at renewable energy um, and energy alone. We've got to think about the material intensity of every um, energy unit that we produce. So if we are producing it from solar panel uh, systems, this solar panel has many, many types of materials uh, embedded in that panel, which then 
um, let's you drill deeper into it, you find uh, metals such as aluminium, copper, even lead, and other such metals um, used to manufacture such a product, such a technology. So it kind of, you know, when we start to roll out massive projects such as solar farms, or as we have in Australia, solar panels on rooftops, we are the leading uh, country in the world with solar panel penetration on, on rooftops. More than 30% of homes have solar panels now. And my estimate says that there is about 54 million panels on rooftops now in Australia, and it's going up um, ever so fast. And that means that we are coming to a uh, situation in the next few years where we will have a massive stockpile of materials. These end-of-life solar panels that we will need to pull off the roofs and uh, maintain or simply start to think about recycling them. Therefore, one needs to think about the energy delivery, this functional unit that we can call one kilowatt hour, along with this material um, use. This is kind of this uh, question you raised earlier about circular economy as well, this exactly. material, material energy nexus. And so this functional unit is very important. And Giorgio mentioned the point about this um, temperature control in Europe and the efficiency improvement that that can bring about if we just reduce temperature by one degree Celsius. Well, you know, we need to start thinking differently rather than falling in trends. And I call the solar panels a big trend. I'm not against renewables. Please don't quote me uh, in that way. I'm all for renewables. However, I'm all for designing these renewable technologies in better ways or even better, designing for the uh, functional unit, which is that one kilowatt hour, which means back to Giorgio's example, which was a good one. Well, we probably in Australia, we, we spend and lose a lot of energy because our homes are not well insulated. So simple insulation measures will create that um, efficiency improvement that we need. And that's that project that we need to attack rather than deliver more and more supply of energy. And that is driven by uh, profit. So we want to be selling more of that product as, as uh, we go forward. So we've got to think differently. We've got to think smarter about that problem. We've got to actually define the problem more correctly or the project more correctly around those functional units. Uh, you're right. Uh Talking about net zero, it's a multifaceted, very complex strategy that needs everybody to be engaged. We have a very interesting question in the chat. Um, Daniel, I guess it's related to you. The question is how we can um, convince leaders to care about intangible projects. Where you talked about community practices, it reminds me that's not just the leaders, it's everybody. Uh, how would you address this question? So in, in terms of, I think it was in terms of um, encouraging engineering faculties, is that right? Yes. Yeah. It's actually a kind yeah. of challenges of research or contribution to the industry. Mm -hmm. No, it's interesting. And I think this also dovetailed on what Georgia said about the intangible projects or the, what I call not projects in the ground, but through the air. You know, they're not, they're, there's nothing vis, vis, uh, physical about them. I think what's well, funny because this is my first year in a business school. Historically, I was an org theorist working in a school of engineering. So historically, I was in school of engineering. This is what I was doing. And I found there was a couple of things that really helped. One is the opportunity. So right now, whether engineering companies like it or not, there's a huge drive towards behavioral and equity change at the government level. They're making it a requirement now for a lot of projects to instill. I'll give an example now um, in terms of, let's just cheat one of them around equity issues. Um, there was a, pro a bridge project in Harris County, Texas, which um, the county there, which is around the Houston area, they decided that the bridge expansion project was asymmetrically harming the Latinx Hispanic community there. The attorney general there filed a lawsuit on civil rights grounds, basically saying that they can't uh, continue the project unless they address this issue. 
And the project's been on pause for one to two years because I don't think there's an understanding on an engineering basis of how to measure equity. What's the outcomes? How far away do we go from the project? If it's a major interstate highway, maybe you have to go miles to look at that. So it's a real opportunity to develop new standards. Um, and it has it's lucrative. Um, the, uh, the unfortunate reality of the, um, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict is also dealing with that because of the energy crisis in Europe. I mean, you're looking overnight 4x increase in energy. I mean, even one degree. I mean, we're, we're having this discussion literally in Oxford right now, which is their energy bill is going 4x. Some, some colleges, just small colleges are paying over half a million pounds for energy. So if you can even reduce a degree, there's a huge opportunity in terms of money. The other thing is the repercussions. So give a couple of examples. Um, uh, female crash test dummies weren't widely used until 2003. So if we're talking about even hard projects, the average height and weight of a crash test dummy for that was designed for women was five foot 110 pounds. The average weight biomechanically female, at least of this context, is five foot four, 170 pounds. So you're using essentially a dummy that's not fit to purpose. And their implication was, was a study ran in the state saying that women were 73% more likely to get killed or seriously injured in a car accident. So, I mean, you see the replications immediately on engineering, and it, it, I've realized that that's driven a lot of action. Um, and there's a book, by the way, on this, Invisible Women. I highly recommend everybody read this. It's a really good book to understand these kind of issues. So the two ways I do it is the opportunity and the new engineering techniques that need to be to address that kind of social reality, and also the repercussions for not doing so. And I think companies, especially now, are really hesitant, especially engineering construction companies, are really hesitant and really worried about being on the wrong side of this. And so that I think that's driven a lot of incentive. We've seen big movement in engineering faculties now to have organizational folks, engineering management programs, really because of some of these issues. Um, so I think that's the kind of ways I've found has actually been useful and, and been able to get um, grant funding even to try to do this work. Fantastic. Beside all this uh, economic be behavioral facts, we as scholars have lots of challenges to implement the projects, get the fund, and you know, uh, run the projects. Giorgio, what uh, few challenges do you see for scholars to uh, define um, net zero projects? For me, the huge challenge is collaboration. So we need to learn how to speak uh, to each other. Because uh, we, as project, as project scholars, we historically have a very narrow collaboration. And most of this collaboration was with engineers. Most of the people in the room are engineers, lovely people, but uh, there is far more than that. So, uh, for, and you can start a collaboration with people uh, in the legal sector, for instance, and I have something going on. And you will find that these people think in a way which is totally different from us. So they have a co different conceptualization of project, dif different conceptualization of research and so far and so forth. And if you speak with people, uh, expert uh, of behavioral change, again, they have a very different way to approach the problem. I mean, the traditional engineering system is problem setting, problem solving, okay? Doesn't work like that. And for me, this is the biggest challenge, opening up and be welcoming and join other community. Fantastic. And I guess this is the challenge that we all are facing. We are trying to communicate uh, clearly with industry and let them know what, what they will face in future. Something that freaks me out is if we do not plan for this uh, very capital intensive projects, uh, we will face high inflation rates in future. It's very close future, which affects our GDP, GPD, um, GDP, sorry. So this is something that we need the whole world to work on it and prevent some problems like Russia and you know, Ukraine. Thank you so much. I really hate to end it up because I'm really enjoying this discussion. We had a very interesting discussion on challenges of achieving net zero and contribution of our research agenda to plan for a better future. Giorgio, Ali, Daniel, um, we are really honored to have you here. And uh, the discussion has been very, very uh, constructive for all of us. I'm sorry that I have to close this session and I would like to ask all our valued participants to join our final session, where Professor Jennifer Wyatt, head of School of Project Management and head of John Grill Institute will wrap up the symposium and 
we will have uh, the announcement for the presentation award. Thank you so much for joining us and have a lovely rest of uh, the day. I'm handing to over to Jennifer, please. Thank you, Masheed, and I've really enjoyed that panel session. It was get, got into some really interesting areas around the futures of projects, and you know, wow, it's really been great um, uh, um, to over the last couple of hours to, um, to hear the fabulous panel discussions and also the amazing work of our international peers. And I've enjoyed seeing some of you on video um, and feeling closer to you. Um, and it's really been a, a, a competitive process around the paper sessions this year. And whether or not you were in those presentations, then I would encourage you to, I would invite you to submit to the related special collection that Mehdi, um, Nada and I are organizing in Project Leadership and Society. The deadline for that is um, the end of 2023. And so there's an opportunity also around the um, next symposium, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand you back to Mehdi to present a uh, best presentation award for this 2022 symposium. Thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> I had the pleasure of chairing the uh, selection committee for the uh, for these short uh, presentation sessions with Associate Professor Natalia Sergiwa, uh, Dr. Sunila Lobo, and uh, Dr. Luigi, Luigi Mosca. Before I announce who wins this competition, this is an exciting moment. Uh, I want to acknowledge the significant work behind these submissions and presentations. I also need to point out that this was a competitive process and it wasn't an easy uh, decision for the selection committee. However, we had to only select one of these short presentations. So the winner of this competition is Jose Rodrigo Vares. Congratulations, Jose, for receiving this award. Jose, if you are here, um, would you like to say a few words about your experience in this symposium? Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, definitely, it's, uh, this is a a great surprise. I'm very happy to to have participated here. I think it's definitely a, a great opportunity to show the 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 rigorous research that that we do in our universities. I mean, I think this is uh, a great opportunity to uh, to collaborate and meet new people also that are interested in the research that that we are doing. Uh, of course, with the great support of my supervisors, uh, Trisano and Giorgio, who both just presented right now in, in their respective sessions. So yeah, I mean, very happy for, for this award and thank you everyone for, um, for selecting me and yeah, very happy <laughs> for this. Thank you, Jose, and uh, thank you everyone who presented who, or who, who was a part of this, uh, uh, this competition. I know uh, now I pass it back to uh, Professor Jennifer White, the director of John Green Institute for Project Leadership to hear her final comments and notes. Back to you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Mehdi. And I'd like to add my congratulations to our award winner and also the co-authors of this research. And I'd like to thank all our presenters, those that submitted papers, those that acted as the review committee, expert panelists, keynote speakers, session chairs, and participants across the two days of this symposium. And a special thanks to the team behind the scenes who are so vital to making an event like this happen. I wanted to say, though, that the dates for the symposium next year, and we really hope that you'll put these straight into your diary. Um, are, um, we're going to run this again um, as a, um, is, so that they're 9th and the 16th of November um, 2023. So we'll we plan to run the 9th as a morning session and the 16th as an evening session to connect with different bits of the world with a call for presentations coming out March, April um, and with a September close. And I really enjoyed the panel sessions and I hope that we can grow that, um, that, that momentum. This is an opportunity to um, have a conference where we don't have to burn so much carbon um, but can come together and can talk about the future of projects and so um i'd like to i'd like to you know um, facilitate that and to and to encourage it and um 
you know, at the John Greel Institute for Project Leadership, we believe that we've got to find new ways to connect across the globe to improve project leadership at this vitally important time. And COP27 is going on at the moment. Um, we're dealing with this changing world. And so we, we really encourage your feedback about what we can do differently, what we can do better, how we can facilitate more conversation um, and also your participation. So thank you for staying with us to the end. Uh, we hope to connect with you also at our events through the year. Um, for the international research community, we invite you to submit um, extended abstracts to um, events that we're running. We have a, the next thing is the mega project workshop that we run in early um, April. We're running in early April here in Sydney um, and, and also the special collection um, associated with the symposium series. For industry colleagues um, joining us, so, so good to have practice and um, pra practitioners and uh, researchers together. Um, please do join our mailing list to be connected with events through the year. And uh, thank you. Please do enjoy the rest of your evening or day. It's been great. Thank you.